This meeting of the Barrington Town Council to order at 7.03 on June 6th, 2022. All members of the council are present. Um, I'd ask if you'd join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <coughs> Uh, we have been reading this land acknowledgement um, at the beginning of meetings uh, to recognize uh, the folks, the, the Poconocet Nation. Akine, we recognize the unique and enduring relationship that exists between indigenous peoples and their traditional territories. We acknowledge that we are in the ancestral homeland of the Poconocet tribe within the original territory of the Poconocet Nation. We commit to ongoing efforts to recognize, honor, reconcile, and partner with the Poconocet people whose ancestral lands and water we benefit from today. Akine. Uh, the next item on our agenda is a resolution. Uh, unless anybody has any questions about it, I wonder if a member of the council will make a motion to um, pass the resolution as presented. Is there a second? Second. Made and seconded, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. The motion carries. Uh, now, I'd like to read this. We have a few things honoring Mr. Benjamin Cello uh, this evening. And I'd like to read this first, and then we will have a presentation from our Senator, Cindy Coyne. Whereas Benjamin Cello was born on June 4, 1922, and grew up in Lincoln, Rhode Island with his three brothers, mom and dad. Whereas at the age of 18, after graduating high school and working only four months in a mill, Benjamin Cello enlisted in the United States Navy. And whereas Benjamin Cello was responsible for making fresh water and filtering diesel fuel in the engine room on an LST-202 landing ship tank, specially designed to transport and deploy troops, vehicles, and supplies onto foreign shores for the conduct of offensive military operations. And whereas by sheer godsend, Benjamin Cello was unable to be transferred to the ship Leopold in the March of 1944, for if he had, the maiden voyage of the Leopold was struck by a German U-boat and sank off the coast of Iceland. And whereas Benjamin Cello was honorably discharged in 1944 and returned home to Lincoln, and whereas upon returning home, Benjamin Cello attended Wentworth College, concentrating in electrical engineering, then transferring to Milwaukee Engineering School in 1948, and whereas after only a few short years teaching math in the Lincoln school system, Benjamin Cello and his three brothers opened Cello's Beef Hearth Family Restaurant in 1955, now known as Cello's Hometown Bar and Grill, Rhode Island's largest privately owned restaurant chain. And whereas Benjamin Cello, while on vacation in Europe, met and married Semink, moved into Barrington in 1972 and had two sons, John and Neil. And whereas Benjamin Cello will have celebrated his 100th birthday on Saturday, June 4, 2022. Now, therefore, let it be resolved that the Honorable Town Council of the Town of Barrington, State of Rhode Island, by virtue of the authority vested in them by the citizens of Barrington on their behalf, and by these presents extend to Benjamin Cello their thanks for his patriotic service and their collective congratulations and best wishes on the celebration of his 100th birthday. Now I'd ask Senator Cindy Coyne to step forward. Uh, thank you to the town council for inviting me to come today and to honor Mr. Cello. Um, hi over there, Mr. Cello. Happy birthday to you. Um, I bring with me uh, good tidings and best wishes from uh, the Rhode Island State Senate here. I have a citation for you, which I'll bring over to you in a moment. And I'm going to be very honored to shake your hand. I've never shaken the hand of a centenarian or 100-year-old uh, gentleman before, so I'm very excited and honored to do so. 
but I will read, uh, you know, just a brief message here. Uh, be it hereby known to all that the Rhode Island Senate hereby offers its sincerest congratulations to Benjamin Cello in recognition of your centenarian or your hundredth birthday. We thank you for your service to our country, sir, and wish you warmest congratulations on this momentous occasion. And it is signed by the president of the Senate, Dominic Ruggiero, myself, as well as the majority leader, Michael McCaffrey. And with that, sir, we wish you a happy birthday. Congratulations. Thank you, Mr. Cello. Uh, the next items on our agenda are our announcements, and I would ask our town manager to take us through those. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> uh, so, first announcement is the Barrington Farmers Market is on the second Thursday, the evening of the evening of the second Thursday, from four to seven p.m. at St. John's Church. Barrington Arts Festival is on Sunday, June 12th from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. at Barrington Town Hall with that features children's activities, food trucks, music, arts and crafts. The uh, summer camps uh, run by the rec department. They start on Monday, June 27th. Openings are still available in tennis camp and theater camp. The first annual Barrington Street Fair put on by the Barrington Business and Community Association is on Sunday, July 17th from three to 6 p.m. on Wood Avenue. We have several openings on boards and commissions that if anybody is interested should contact the clerk, town clerk's office. The Economic Development Commission has one vacancy, a full member. The planning board has a one vacancy, the second alternate. The Resilience and Energy Committee has one vacancy, the first alternate. The tree planting and removal update from May 1st of last year to April 30th of this year, 77 trees were removed, 79 trees were planted. A few additional notes that on the agenda, the Film Forward event at uh, Town Hall will be taking place June 24th through June 26th. The um, Park and Rec Recreation Commission has scheduled a workshop for the public to discuss the plans for improvements at Haynes Park. That workshop will be on June, June 30th. Michelle, am I correct on June 30th at 7 p.m.? Michelle would correct me, I hope. <laughs> yes, yes, that's correct. Bill. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. And that will be at the Peck Center for Adult Enrichment. Um, and taxes are due on June 30th. So those are the announcements. Thank you. Uh, before we get into the next set of items, I wanted to see if any member of the council wanted to highlight anything. We can obviously pull anything off we need to, but if anyone wanted to highlight something, I'd give them this chance. Okay. The next group of items are what we call the consent agenda. Uh, these are considered routine by the town council and are typically enacted with one motion. There won't be a separate discussion on these items unless a council member or citizen so requests, and the request is for good cause in which the event, in which event the item will be removed from the consent agenda and will be considered in its normal sequence on the agenda. Does anyone on the council have anything they want to remove from the consent agenda? Okay, anyone from the public? have anything they want to remove for the from the consent agenda for separate consideration. Uh, if, Phil, is there anyone raising their hand oh. online? Um, I see no one raising their hand. Uh, do I hear a motion to accept the consent agenda as presented? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And no abstentions. The motion carries. Um, there won't be any interviews and appointments this evening. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the public comment. This is an agenda item for members of the public to speak regarding a topic that is not already on the agenda. If you'd like to speak, please indicate you'd like to. 
uh, by raising your hand either online or, or here. Uh, when you're recognized, please state your name and residency for the record. This is a maximum three minute statement. Does anyone here wish to be heard? Yes, sir, please. Hi, <clears throat> Stephen Venuti, uh, president of the Barrington Preservation Society, 17 Stanhope Drive. A couple of years ago, in response to a newfound interest in the slave monument at Princess Hill Cemetery, this council asked the Barrington Preservation Society for help researching the unnamed slave referenced on the monument. I'm sorry to interrupt. Yes, is this, the, there's another item on the agenda, which is the medallion program. Is that, that what this, this is it? Is, I, I, I think we've gone ahead one. I just want to see if anyone from the public has anything other than that to, oh, to okay. talk about. So I'm sorry to interrupt, but That's okay. are there any hands up, Phil? Uh, one well, now, um, Lauren Schlanger. I'll allow her to talk. Okay. Um, so we'll get right back to you. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. Ms. Schlanger. Yes, hi. Can you hi. hear me okay? Yes. Great, thanks. Um, I'm Lauren Schlanger. I'm a resident of Two Haynes Park Road, and I want to just appreciate uh, the fact that you made this meeting um, hybrid so that I could join due to child care issues, and I'm sure a lot of um, it just makes it more accessible. And I wanted to request um, regarding the Parks and Recreation workshop for the Haynes Park proposal. Um, with regards to accessibility, you know, I would like to request that there is more than one meeting um, or, or workshop as part of an hopeful ongoing community engagement project to make the park um, a plan that works for the local residents as well as the town overall and, and something that the Parks and Rec um, Council Committee, excuse me, would approve of, but something that the neighbors will also be in favor of. And I know a lot of people are not able to attend that workshop, which is the Thursday evening before a um, long holiday weekend. A lot of people are out of town and would just like to request that it there be um, more than one meeting to discuss those plans so that the meeting's accessible to um, various people with, with different schedules and whatnot. Thank you. Thank you. We do have our... Um liaisons to the Parks and Rec and a member, at least one member of the Parks and Rec here. So I'm sure they'll pass that along to uh, the chair. Uh, any other hands raised, Phil? That, that's the only hand. Okay. Okay, I'm closing public comment then. The next item on our agenda is uh, the Rhode Island Slave History Medallion Program. Um, we have Mr. Stephen Venuti from, from Barrington who is um, the, the, the head of our preservation society. And we also have Mr. Charles Roberts. Mr. Venuti, if, if I could ask you to come forward again, I apologize for that. Okay, uh, back again. As I said before, a couple of years ago in response to a newfound interest in the slave monument at Princess Hill Cemetery, this council asked the Barrington Preservation Society for help researching the unnamed slave referenced on the monument. Since that time, our research, along with the research done by Roger Williams University's Dr. Carrington Farmer and her students, has found that Barrington's deep roots of slavery date back to the earliest 17th century European settlers in the area. Thomas Willett, who purchased the land where we now stand from the Massasoit Osemaquin had a direct interest in the slave trade and listed eight Negro slaves in his will written in 1674. A slave owned by the Reverend John Miles who erected the first meeting house on what is now the Knockham Hill Lot 3A property was one of the first to be killed in the King Philip's War in 1675. Miles's will, dated 1682, named five Negro slaves. By 1774, 100 years later, the colonial census of Barrington listed a total of 57 slaves, 18 Indians and 39 Negroes. At least 13 of these enslaved Negroes and Indians enlisted as soldiers in the American Revolution in an effort to earn their own freedom. Most of them failed. 
Slavery continued in Barrington well into the 19th century with the last known slave recorded in, 18, in the Barrington's 1830 census. With this background, I now introduce Mr. Charles Roberts, who will explain how his Rhode Island Slave History Medallion Program will help preserve this history and make it accessible to the public. And I would hope that this council will approve uh, our request. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Benuti. Mr. Roberts. Good evening. <clears throat> I'm Charles Roberts, of uh, the, the founder and the uh, executive director for Rhode Island Slave History Medallions. Uh, we've, uh, we're a, uh, we, what we do is we, I'm nervous, you guys, I must say. <laughs> I, uh, uh, what we do is we mark the landscape across the state of Rhode Island with these slave related medallions with QR codes that when you walk up to them and place your phone there, this is for our young people that are involved in the future, which is phone. Uh, they can see and hear their history right where they stand. I, I even say the place where you stand is holy ground. Why? Because that's your history. And even though I'm talking about slave related history, we know that the original sin uh, or, uh, of the United States was slavery. And we're suffering with it today. But we also have to realize by telling the story of not only the slaves, but the enslavers, that we're telling not just slave history, but American history. And that's what I'm here, and that's what I'm commemorating, and that's why I've created uh, this medallion, bronze medallion, to be placed in commemoration of our history across the state of Rhode Island. Right now we have, this year we'll have 12. By the time we're finished in five years, there'll be 25 in every city in town that was related, related to slave history at that time. So that we leave something for our children's children to remember who we are as Americans. And I have brought one with me. <laughs> Pretty heavy. Uh, this is a bronze medallion image. Now, while uh, you've noticed that it's an angel image, this image was carved by Pompey Stevens in 1768. I found it in the uh, God's Little Acre in Newport. When I was a kid back in the day, I used to play in the graveyard and jump off of the Van Van Pier, and I'd run through and see this thing. And, oh, that's me. So I run through the, 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 the graveyard and I'd see this thing sitting here. Well, when, after living in uh, uh, North Africa and Brazil and, uh, and, and traveling extensively across the world, I found out when I came back and ran through Gosling Laker, I saw these angel images. And it looked like I was standing in a sea of angels. So I said to myself, what is it? So I researched it and found out that this was carved by Pompey Stevens, the slave of, of the John Stevens shop. And so I reproduced it in bronze. Uh, I've been a, an artist all my life. I worked with Warner Atlantic Collector Records for 40 years. So one of the things, since I've promoted music, and I'm talking, we're talking about Shaka Khan and Grandmaster Flash and James Brown, I'm promoting our history now with these symbols. And with these symbols comes this. This is a 59 words that describes the location of where you're standing. And this will be placed below the medallion. So then when somebody who doesn't have a phone can go up there and still hear or see their history just at a glance. And these are all browns. They're mounted on a, they're, they're mounted on a, uh, uh, a, a plume, which is uh, about this high and an angle so that all people going by, even kids can get a chance to participate in their history by scanning it. And it's, uh, I mean, and I just have a little story for it. There's, there was a young girl that came from Barrington, didn't know her. She wanted, and her mother, they wanted to meet me at Bowen's Wharf. 
because they wanted to see where slaves came from. So I met her down there and, and I talked to her and she was very anxious and eager. She, I explained the story to her about how the slaves came in and how they, they, were, they, they were the people that contributed to the economic development of our country. She, I mean, she was so ecstatic. I said, so what college do you go to? She said, college, I'm in high school. And I mean, that was one of the time, the first young person I ever met from Barrington. And that's left a lasting impression on me to know and really pushed to have these medallions at your library. And I'm fortunate enough that Chris is, is contributing to it because by the, it's, that's not a slave related history. It's a Barrington related history so that every kid that walks into that school, into the church, I mean, into the library, schools, churches, libraries, you know, those, <laughs> those dynamics, uh, every church uh, that walks into the library can have a chance to scan it and see and know their history. And uh, so that's why we picked that location. I don't know if it's on the screen, but uh, it's, it's just the perfect site because it's neutral, it's also weird wheelchair accessible, so that uh, it, it becomes a, a, a place of commemoration of your history. So, uh, well, that's my story and I'm sticking with it. <laughs> and so I'm very happy and fortunate to have Barrington uh, want to contribute to our country by placing the medallions. I'm with the 250th Anniversary Commission with Mary Garbea, and that's one of the reasons that we're placing these medallions across the state. So in 2026, when we have our centennial, they'll be there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. Um, for the folks who couldn't, uh, who couldn't access the materials online, um, the proposed location is right in the front of the library between the steps and the wheelchair ramp just immediately to the right of the front door. Uh, so it'd be a, a great location for this. Um, thank you very much, sir. Um, members of the council, does someone want to make a motion? I, sure. Oh, please. I have a, just a, a question before. Um, with the installation of the medallion, is there an opportunity to have some sort of, um, I guess not not ribbon cutting, but installation ceremony? And I, I see a, oh. Uh, yes, with uh, every uh, medallion, we do a ceremony uh, that I call an act of remembrance. Because, uh, and I've done this across the state, when families get together with their children and experience something together as a family, it's something they can commemorate as a family and remember together. So we don't do uh, uh, programs without at least having a, a commemoration. It's called an act of remembrance. And it really, it, it, makes, it makes you own it. And you want your kids to own this uh, opportunity. So yes, we do that, and we also videotape it, and so that, and put it on our our website for a sixty second spot, so that uh, it'll always be there. Because uh, I hate to say it, our young people look at things, and if you don't catch them in sixty seconds, they're gone. <laughs> so thank, you. thank you, sir. Please, Mr. Venuti. Yeah, in, in terms of a presentation, um, actually a month or so ago, we did a presentation at the Bay Spring Community Center. And putting that together, we had the students from Roger Williams University who, who helped us with our research. And uh, Dr. Carrington Farmer's husband is a professor of graphic arts. So he was able to get the students to put all of the research that they did into little panels. And our plan is that uh, as part of the celebration that we will do when the, when the medallion is placed, is that we will have a display of all of that research work. It's very accessible, very uh, professionally done. And that will be the basis. And there'll be some speeches uh, with greatly expanded stuff on the stuff that I've been telling you. So yes, we do, we, we are hoping for a, 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 a citywide commemoration. Thanks. 
Thank you. Any other questions? So I just wonder if we might ask the DEI committee to maybe work with the Pres Preservation Society on um, and and um, and uh, your your organization as well um, to to put that together to really get the whole community involved. Uh, sure. I don't know if that has to be part of the motion, but I don't think so. Yeah. I think we can just um, delegate to the DEI committee to work with them on that presentation. Um, then, please. The library has been working with Mr. Roberts and the Cleveland Institute Joint Preservation Library, but happy, you know, more the merrier. Yeah, absolutely. So I just wanted to put that in. Um, our community engagement librarian is kind of working on this. So <coughs> great. But we'll connect. Good. Great. Anything else? Does anyone want to make? Oh, oh sir, please, Mr. Cello. Thank you very much for telling me. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> the only thing is about medallions. Well, I get a lot of mail, and it seems like every day I get mail from uh, Indian Association. It's great with the medallions, but you better figure out how to feed them first so we can study. I get mail, I swear, every day from different uh, uh, Indian places. Okay, right. thank you. Before you, you go, let me shake your hand. Yeah. <laughs> now, now, you got a place in South Dakota. You've got Indians there. They're in a place, you can't, it's rocky. It doesn't even have water. They have to bring the water with a tank trailer. For God's sakes, couldn't you find a land that had a little stream for Christ's sakes and give them something to do? Well, no they, water. Well, one of the things that why we make this commemoration, and by the way, to be able to shake hands with a hundred year old man is oh. the highest compliment that I have had in a very long yeah. time. My, my, my uncle was, the mayor of Newport, yeah. Rhode Island, the only black mayor well, they ever had. And he's yeah, just passed yeah. and given me this legacy. Yeah. So well, to be able to talk to you about it is well, sensational. Well, don't give me credit. I ended up marrying a Turkish girl and her and her sister comes here to the, and I couldn't get over it. Every day they got at me said, why don't you help the people, the Indian people? And this is what, 52 years ago. And I still do it. Thank you, sir. You gotta feed them. <laughs> you can't study with an empty stomach. And we'll feed the kids to go with it. Try, try it. <laughs> so the school with no food. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Um, okay. I'll make a motion. Please. Um, I'd like to make a motion to approve the proposed installation of the Rhode Island Slave History Medallion outside the Barrington Library and the request of $2,500 in funding to come from the council contingency. The motion has been made. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Second. The motion is made and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. Thank you very much, Mr. Roberts, Mr. Venuti, Ms. Chin. We appreciate it. Uh, next item on our agenda is to discuss and act on invasive species control at Echo Lake. This has been continued from February 7th. Is Mr. Barton, Mr. Barton, yeah. yes, sir. I'm hoping you've had some luck with the people at the country club. I, I have. Uh, we, we have had some success with the country club and a donation there. Um, I have had some potential success with neighbors abutting uh, Echo Lake. Uh, most importantly, uh, we do not at this point have permission to uh, to treat the invasive species. However, um, uh, the uh, I, I don't know what his term would be. The scientist, anyway, that works at CRMC uh, had a problem with the application, which I saved us five thousand dollars by writing myself, and we fixed the. We fixed that, and so now he said that we should be receiving the assent for that process uh, within the next few weeks. Uh, that organization does not work on a speedy basis, basis whatsoever. 
but hopefully by let's say the end of this month at the earliest at the latest i will have the assent to go ahead and proceed with the application of chemicals to uh, treat the uh, fan wart on the uh, on the pond uh, i've also been working with rhode island country club not only to get some monies to to uh to work with this project but to treat phragmites on the pond because it's most important that we treat phragmites on their property uh, on the golf course part of their property uh, as well as the pond to keep the phragmites off the pond so we've been working diligently on that uh, the the numbers have changed somewhat the total number for the first year is um i don't want to be mistaken here it was it's uh, thirty four thousand two hundred and fifty dollars the second year fifteen five hundred the third year ten thousand five hundred and so on we're trying to get a 10-year permit for this uh to to proceed uh i asked for the town from the town of barrington for twenty thousand dollars i'm anticipating in excess of five thousand dollars from around country club but also included in that number that i just gave was treating of the phragmites which i'm hoping rhode island country club will cover completely and so the that makes the the total commitment for uh for just treating the fan wart on the pond which is you can see it on the surface right now if you go over there it's it's out of control uh just for that piece it's uh it's about $23,000. And so, uh, and I've got 5,000 definitely from the country club, but I think more. So, um, and I, as I said, I can get some a commitment from neighbors, but until I have the assent in hand, it's hard to go to them. I have uh, previously, I have multiple neighbors and, and people that live in the town of Barrington that have donated to this cause. And so I think I can go back to them uh, without a problem. Mm -hmm. So that's where we stand. As you know, I've been in front of the Conservation Commission as well as the Energy and Resilience Committee, and they've given you my rep their report. I don't know what that is, but okay. So that's where we are. Uh, so I am the liaison to the Resilience and Energy Committee. Okay. Um, their analysis was that it did not have they they suggested that the conservation commission was probably the the better body to be looking at it but they said they did not believe that the uh impact on stormwater runoff um, would be dramatic they weren't weighing in one way or the other except to say that um, they did say that if it if the um, pond were to eventually become a meadow which is ultimately what happens if you don't do anything about these right then the um the property most in danger is the country club uh, because of the way that the, the land is is pitched uh, so the country club would be most in danger of flooding if if that area became uh, a meadow but they th that was the response of the um resilience and energy i'm not sure what the conservation commission uh response was do we yeah the conservation commission um would be supportive but they were not aware and they would rather um investigate the resiliency point that you just made they they when it, when it was brought to them they when they voted in in favor there were a couple of issues one was that issue which they were unaware of at the time and secondly um there's some concern about us not as a town having control over the property they think the better the the, the you need a long-term plan going forward so that we're not just always going back to the well and having kind of a, a longer term haphazard approach um it would be best and you could satisfy those concerns were the country club to grant the lake to the town it is somewhat unusual and possibly a moral hazard certainly in my view um to subsidize private property improvements especially when we're not talking about a situation of financial need. Although when you first appeared before us, I certainly grant that there's public use. However, the country club could cease that use uh, at any time it, it should it choose to. And so we, we don't have, um, we don't have the, what I think is, is firm enough ground to, um, 
to move to move forward at this time. Now, I know you asked for the conservation view, but that discussion devolved into that. And so my own view, of course, led into my response to your question, President Carl. I apologize for that. No, no, that's OK. Um, uh, it is a concern. Um, funding private property. We've done it before. You did it before. That's correct. Uh, I believe we did $5,000 six I, years ago. I think somewhere in that neighborhood. Maybe I thought it was north of 5,000, but it was in that neighborhood. And I remember that the, how much was it? 8,400? 8,390. Okay. And and how much did the uh, country club provide? I think we got, that was We 20. got over 5,000 from them at that point in time. I think it was like 7,500. I thought it was more than us. I was. Uh, it, could, it could have been. They gave it to us in two chunks. I remember that. It yeah. Could have been as much as ten thousand. Yeah. But um, so that's um, my concern is, um, you know, the moral hazard that that we talked about funding private property. Now we mm -hmm. have done it in the past for this. Um, uh, we did it based on the i not based on the idea of recreation, but rather really. My mem this is my memory um, of that meeting. We did it based on the idea that we needed a place for our water to go. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I do have a concern about it, was hoping for more from the, uh, from the country club um, to sort of lead the way on it. But um, other members of the council have thoughts on this? Yeah, my, my view is because it's, um, it's an issue that's on private property and the negative impact is also to private property. Um, I, I think funding half um, because it is, there is benefit to the community as well. I think funding half is certainly appropriate, but it sounds like we're, we're much more, much more than that at this point. If we were to, if we were to put in $20,000, the requested amount. Right. Um, can I ask a, a question? Um, to the to the extent that that this is permissible, and, and I, I I wonder if Mr. Hervey could enlighten us as to any any uh, discussions with the, uh, the Rhode Island Country Club that could be made public, or any positions that they've taken uh, in in your communications with them. I have this I disclosed it in the memo that I didn't meet with them, and it was just really preliminary, just to say that. Um, just to kind of feel out whether they're interested in, in providing permanent public access to the, the lake itself, the pond, um, and um, or ownership, granting ownership. And they uh, they were appreciative of the meeting, and they seem to be willing to consider it. But I haven't we haven't heard back since. So um, I think it's still an ongoing discussion. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Please. So, and given that response, the, the first thing that pops into my mind is, is the discussion premature if the, if the talks with Rhode Island Country Club aren't complete and there's an opportunity for more money um, from the Country Club if they're so willing to do so. Um, I mean, I, you know, I'd hate to make a commitment and then they say, okay, we're, we're good. We'll wipe our hands clean of that one now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think it's only fair to kind of see that one through to the end um, to see how far they're willing to go and, you know, then the town can talk about assisting from there. Right. Um, I, I feel that uh, Mr. Barton has come here. This will be the second time and I'm, I'm sorry for that. But I also feel that it, it you know, it's fair for us to expect I more totally from the owner understand. of the property. Totally understand. Um, I also think that maybe when you, when you get that assent, you will, it'll, will have it sort of in black and white. Yeah. No. In, in any case, even if you authorize the money tonight, you're not going to give us the money until I prevent you. I present you with the assent as well as the bill for the property. So right. um, that's the only way that it's going to happen. So right. I understand that. Uh, as far as the country club is concerned, I'm a member of the country club. I, I mentioned it to several people there. Uh, I, I totally agree with them giving it to the town if the town wants it. I'm not sure that the town wants it, uh, but you have to wait and to see the town had the country club has no use for the country for the property whatsoever. Mm -hmm. uh, they, I'm sure that years ago that it was included in that piece of property that they bought and they thought they might use the water at some point in time. They've never, ever used the water and they never will. So right. Right. that's my view. Okay. Um, so uh, how, how will we leave this then? You'll, uh, Phil will uh, address the country club again and 
if you want to help me engage re re-engage the country club since you're a yeah sure i'm glad that to help, help in any way i can sure yeah, that could help because i've uh yeah. i've presented to made this presentation to them before and so and there's a by the way there's a new president now who was not there two months ago or a month the, ago who's the new president now i uh, can't remember his name uh malik is his last name okay okay yeah okay Okay. And then just one other thing with respect to timing. Thanks again for coming and sorry that you've had to, to take That's okay. steps. Um, the CRMC permit being issued in a few weeks, um, that might, it, it, I assume that probably would be granted, but that might, you know, assist with respect to timing if that permit is secured and in place, um, unless it's not necessary to those negotiations. I, I just assume that it would be. I'm not sure I understand your question. I, I'm not sure it, it's necessary for the discussion with the country club at all just in terms of having everything kind of buttoned up by the time we, we, yeah. we talk about it and make uh, some sort of de well, determination on I it. talked with the I talked with a scientist down there a week and a half two weeks ago now and he indicated it'd be coming shortly so um I can okay. call him again the trouble is <laughs> well if I phone call I'll phone I'll phone him tomorrow I won't hear from him for at least a week after that phone call at least mm -hmm. That's the trouble. <laughs> so, you know, tough to deal with. Well, uh, hopefully, further discussions with the country club will be fruitful. Okay. Maybe you could. I'm tell them, happy to help. Yep. You could tell them of uh, the possibility of a dramatic expansion of a water hazard on one of their greens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they wouldn't appreciate that. I'm sure. <laughs> Okay. But thank, thank you for coming in. Very good. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Um, you. You can put it on a new council agenda once you have more information. You don't have to continue it. Okay. So we'll bring this up when we get further information. Uh, next item on our agenda is uh, to discuss and act on the transfer of town owned street lights. Uh, for these are for the roads that are um, state roads. Um, and I'd ask Phil, will, will you take us to this or will Teresa? No, I can handle this. Okay. okay. Um, get caught up here. So the state has offered to purchase but for a dollar <laughs> the town owned, town owned street lights. Of, of town, towns and cities that have met the criteria that's outlined on page four of my memo. And that includes the fact that um, obviously if you, yet you own these streetlights on state roads, which we do, they've been converted to LED, which we have, and um, the, all these other agreement, all these other conditions, which are pretty, pretty straightforward. So, um, the last step would be that the council would, would have to approve the transfer of these 366 lights that have been verified by the state as being part of their, their inventory that they would be taking over. Mm -hmm. um, the council would have to approve that for that to happen. So um, okay. that's, that's about 20% of our street lights. So and dramatically decrease our costs. It helps uh, to cut our, you know, our costs, um, our street light annual budget. And um, each one of these lights can be about a thousand dollars. That's sometimes to replace. So um, over time, these last these last twelve, fifteen years or more, um, but they do fail uh, as well. So you have to get a guy in a truck, and it costs eight eight hundred thousand dollars. Been going up, obviously recently. The cost to maintain these lights, plus the ongoing bills that we get from National Grid. That's um, as well another cost. And we have a uh, an agreement. The joint agreement with Bristol with Siemens to do the maintenance on the lights that we, we own. We actually moved on from Siemens. We have uh, Arden Engineering. Ar Arden's a company that does it now. Uh, they're actually lower, cheaper than, <laughs> turns out, than Siemens. So, um, and they they've been doing it for the last couple of years. And we'll, uh, I mean, is the contract that we have with Arden. Um, flexible enough that we could divest ourselves of 20% of our street lights. It's just on a case by case basis with Arden. We get a ticket in that they don't care where it is, what street it's on. So right. I don't think that's an issue. 
Now, um, you've also mentioned that we could remove the control, the lighting controllers that we have in there. What advantage would there be in removing those? The advantage is you have a stockpile of them for town, for the remaining town inventory of about 1500 lights uh, or any additional ones. So they've, they can be expensive to, if they fail to replace or add a new one, um, you have to reprogram them into the SimCon control system. Um, so he suggested maybe like 40 of them as a stockpile, maybe more than that. But um, so I got a quote from our, our maintenance contractor and they, they, they quoted that to replace 40 of them with standard photo cells, then the cost of the town would be about two thousand dollars. Just to, but so if you want eighty, it'd be like four thousand dollars. Right. Now, um, is there any reason? I mean, have we explored the idea of maintaining those controllers and just even though the state owns them, integrating them? That can't be done. The state's condition is that that uh, we wouldn't be able to control them. But if you take them out, you can't control them. The state couldn't control them either. So, but it's it's tied to our, they are within our network. So the state couldn't. We'd have to maintain. We had to control them or give the state access to our own interface. So because mm -hmm. it's controlled by these four gateways, you can't decouple them. Basically, if you take a controller out, it has to be within that zone. So there are four zones. Each controller, you have to mark. You have to put in a box for that zone because they can't move from to a different zone the way they're programmed. <laughs> So um, if the state would could use them, they'd have to log into our system. So just because maybe people aren't following, uh, what we're talking about is um, you can have dumb street lights and you can have smart street lights. We have smart street lights that we can turn up and turn down. Um, so there have been times when we have increased the wattage. You know, we, we talk about doing this for Halloween and prom night and, and things where you want extra bright light um, and those controllers uh, it, it, what what I've been asking about is whether the state would allow us to continue to control street lights owned by the state and it sounds like they won't so uh, we would have to limit our control of the street lights to non-state roads um, which means we could still turn it up and turn it down on on important uh, nights, uh, graduation night, that sort of thing that we worry about uh, and maybe need more. Or if there was, you know, people have even said, even if there was um, a missing person and you wanted to make it a little easier to look for them. So, so it sounds like we can't do that, but that would be on Little Highway and- um, Washington Road, Washington Middle Road. Highway, County Road, Solms, New Meadow, Massasoit. Mm -hmm part of Rumstick, Nat. Right, but we would re reduce, not necessarily a 20% reduction in and cost. Um, yeah, about 20%, based okay. on the numbers, be 20%. Okay, sorry, I've been monopolizing this because I've been interested in street lights, as exciting <laughs> as that is. Um, anyone else have questions? I, I had a couple questions. Um, so right now, if if a light fails and needs to be replaced, I assume we we notice some of those, and residents probably call and say a street lights out. What would the service be like on you know for these twenty percent of lights? Would would they be replaced as quickly? Do we have anything like that in the contract? I don't know because we don't have the that experience. It's kind of a new experience. We didn't own them. Now we own them, and then now we're giving it back to uh, the state. That would handle basically the same process as before. The state would have to handle that maintenance request. So um, it would probably be a little bit slower, but maybe not. I mean, it is a state road depending on the priority. So it's hard to say. I'm, I can't say for sure. The, the other question was um, when 5G um, first came in, there was, I don't know if it was an ordinance or policy that we passed where before any 5g equipment went up on poles it, it would have to come back before the council before approval if we don't own the poles would it be then the state that would decide for 5g installation on the poles or would we still maintain that authority i, I thought it was just the lights that were... well the controllers could do, so we could make 
with the control boxes we have, theoretically, we could make the town one Wi-Fi town. Um, and that idea can be used to, in theory, uh, boost cell signal. There are parts of town with terrible cell signal. Uh, and I think that's what Councilor Breyer is talking about. Um, but uh, I don't even know if we can legally do that. I think it's that's a state level PUC. We can't we can't like install it on on. And I'm pretty sure uh, Councilor Castell was looking into whether we could do that at least at the Wi-Fi level. I don't know about 5G. Yeah, I go ahead. I, I just remember it was maybe two two or three years ago. Um, a proposal came before us to allow the leasing of either the control boxes or, or whatever to um, cell companies, Verizon, Sprint, et cetera, um, to install 5G. And so we we passed an in, in ordinance, I don't remember the, the details, but part of it was that before it went into place, it would come back before the council so we could, that um, somebody had raised concerns over the, the safety of it. And so it would give us the opportunity to vet it. I just want to make sure that this wouldn't negate any protection we had in place. If they're not our street lights, right. we, we wouldn't yeah. have control. Right. So, so if, like, would the state do it though? So if it local benefit, the state. Yeah. And, and um, we were talking about at least removing some of the, some of the controllers, which would make them dumb street lights yeah. again. And it's probably not that effective to have a strip as opposed to full coverage. So. Right. Right. My, my sense is that we have some open questions here we would want answered. Is there any urgency in this? You think we continue? Oh, sorry. So every um, municipality in the state has been given this opportunity and just about everyone that I'm aware of has taken advantage of it because there's a tremendous savings to the local taxpayers. Johnston started the process and actually won a lawsuit that basically said they shouldn't be having to pay for street lights on state roads. I, I understand we're asking these other tangential questions. I, I think the policy decision is, does this make financial sense? Um, <clears throat> I really do think there are issues with the 5G. It's, I, I don't believe we'll have any control over that at all. Because we don't have any control over um, uh, many of the items related to um, cell towers other than you know zoning, that type of thing. But we can't stop the frequencies, um, et cetera. So um, I, I think, I, I don't know if we're going to find out any more information between now and the next meeting on this. If you think it makes sense for the taxpayers, I would recommend that you approve it. And again, most communities are doing so for that reason. Yep, please. I, um, I just want to echo um, what Mr. Silla was saying. I um, have a, a, a familiarity with um, the streetlight sales in Rhode Island, including for the state of Rhode Island. Um, my recommendation would be for the town to let the state purchase the lights for three reasons. Number one, the cost. Number two, the responsibility for maintenance. And then number three, the liability that comes with lights. And if there's a malfunctioning light, a light that's out that we don't know about, I'd venture to guess, although I don't know if this would be true or not, I think the control issue on the state roads would probably notice only a minimal change in terms of, I mean, I, I doubt there are many reasons why today we would dim the lights on state roads or at least significantly dim the lights on state roads. So it, it, in my opinion, I'd, I'd recommend that we give these lights to the, the state and get them off our plate, reap the benefits of the cost and not having to worry about the maintenance and some other things. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree with you that, um, you know, having the state maintain that removes permanently a cost to us, um, which, which is really, we, lo we do lose control over those. We had control briefly. Um, Fortunately, during that time when we had control, we converted to LEDs, which means the failure rate is much lower and folks won't be having to call twice 
uh, over a 20 year period, unless there's a real problem with that particular street light, uh, because they can last up to 20 years. Um, so um, my view that would be that we should uh, accept the one dollar from the um, from the state and and sell our uh, our liability to them. Any any other points? Uh, I'll make a motion to approve the agreement between the state of Rhode Island Department of Transportation and the town of Barrington for the. Oh. Oh. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, that, was, that was just a knee jerk interruption. I'm so sorry. Uh, okay. <laughs> I, I'll interrupt at the appropriate time next okay. time. <laughs> uh, for the gratis transfer of the state of town owned streetlight facilities located on state roads. The motion's been made. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Further discussion. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> that's I meant to say something. Um, if we approve this, we would need to update the agreement in a few different areas, um, given that there's now a new utility in Rhode Island. Um, I assume the state would be on top of this, but I have the specific language in terms of what the agreement would need to say if this were to be approved. Um, it, I don't know if now's the time or just work with you uh, after. If this is approved by the council, send it to me. Yeah, and I'll work to make sure it's incorporated. Okay, just yeah, just so folks know, just Mer the Narragansett Electric Company, DBA, Rhode Island Energy, and it would need to be defined as Rhode Island Energy. So, uh, agreed. But that's that's the official uh, slogan there. So, okay, okay. A motion. Really, other yes, please. Um, we just just to close the loop on on the telecommunications issue. You recall that we encourage the state to pass enabling legislation in order to centralize the a, a rollout of uh, fiber optic and, and, and higher quality um, internet service as well. And if we right now we are preempted um, from taking any action on our own with regard to the smart controls, we can't we can't do that. There's even some question about community Wi-Fi and whether we'd be able to do that. Um, so just, you know, it's not as if we're foregoing or giving up an opportunity that's right in front of us. We we would need the legislature to act actually right. on that. And, and I don't see it, an indication that that's happening at this time. So, right. Okay. Um, motion has been made and seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And no abstentions, that motion carries. Thanks, Phil, for taking us through that. Um, Next item on our agenda is to discuss an act on a resolution authorizing the town manager to execute an electricity supply agreement to provide electricity supply for Barrington's community aggregation program. Uh, and, and we have some folks from Good Energy here uh, to help explain this for us. I have a presentation I can share on my screen. Oh, that'd Good be energy. great. Um, as long as that works, yes. Sure. Is it going to be behind me? Yeah. Just so I know. Okay. So I'm going to. I apologize if I constantly turn my back, especially on you. I'll try to. I'll try to spread it around. Um, and once again, uh, my name is Jamie Rhodes. Uh, I'm with uh, Good Energy, and for the record, I'm at 160 Winsocket Hill Road in North Smithfield. Um, and so I'm before you today because we are as has from, from a number of you it's been about three years uh, that we started working on this and i really do appreciate the patience of the, both the council and members of the administration about how long it has taken from the start of the aggregation process uh to what is at least for me a really exciting moment of this week in fact um, and so well, the opportunity that we have now is to finally take this from the conversation around should we aggregate the electricity load to actually let's get some pricing and decide whether we're actually going to go forward with this. So we go to the next slide here. Um, just as a quick reminder, I tried to do this at all times to like ground everyone of what we're talking about. This is once again, not changing who our utility is. They've already done that on their own. Um, so we have a new utility here, but there's no change to the delivery services. And I apologize, I have not updated this to say Rhode Island Energy. We got a lot of work to change names here, but we're not changing the method of delivery. The wires, the poles will still be owned by uh, PPL and Rhode Island Energy, the storm response. Uh, but what we're talking about is changing who uh, supplies our electricity uh, for the town of uh, Barrington. And so this would be about changing our default electricity supply 
even though um, it's not a mandate, there is a, a automatic enrollment for folks that are on uh, National Grid's or Rhode Island Energy's last resort service would be uh, automatically enrolled in this program. Those are folks that have not gone out to the market to, uh, to uh, actively select an electricity supplier. Um, these are folks that are just taking the default service right now, and we would be modifying who is supplying that default service. Um, and so we'll go through kind of why this is our opportunity to take an action um, now. So if we go to the the next slide here, it's um, so these are all the folks that are, be, are currently working with uh, with Good Energy. So right now we're in a position to to finalize six a six community bid uh, for electricity supply, and that's with Providence, Central Falls, here in Barrington, Portsmouth, Newport, and South Kingstown. I still have Narragansett up there. They're in the process of approving their plan, but they're not going to make it in for this bid. So um, as much as they're kind of bummed about that, uh, that's just the, the nature of how long it takes for some of this work to happen. Um, so since the end of 2021, we've been engaged with the suppliers that are interested in serving these programs um, as a as a um, uh, as an aggregate of aggregations. Um, and since that time, we've been able to, this is the first time that aggregation will be launching in Rhode Island. So there's been some work to identify what's their methodology, uh, what is like, how would they do the electricity procurement? Uh, what is the method that we think is going to be best for us to get uh, both stable and competitive prices for a longer period, for a longer period of time? Um, and so we've been working since about 2021 to vet the supplier proposals um, to identify what's going to be the best method to move forward. Um, so within those different approaches, there's also been the need to um, kind of land some corollary policies in Rhode Island to make sure the aggregations are going to be effective. The last one of those to land was purchase of receivables, which was official as of April 1 of, um, I believe it was April 1 of this year, 2022, where that was finally in place, which has given us that last piece we need to kind of take this out to, um, out to bid. So with the corollary programs done, it's now, now it's time. Um, I think everybody has heard, especially in the news, that electricity prices are volatile. Um, there's a lot of disruption, especially in natural gas markets, that kind of plays into this. Um, and so with all expectations of that prices aren't going to suddenly plummet today, I mean, we're kind of in a, a system, you see the gas prices, these things are all interconnected. Um, we are at highs now, but I don't think there's any expectation that they're going to fall off a cliff anytime soon, or the expectation is that we're probably still going to have, if not marginal, significant, if marginal, if not significant, continued rises, especially in natural gas prices. So in order for us to kind of try to take the peak off of what we see prices being, we think now's the opportunity to kind of lock in a contract for a couple of years for our electricity supply, uh, electricity supply in order to kind of keep us from having to go along with that the, the peak that we might see. So if we go to the, the next slide, um, just kind of lay this out in a timeline of what we've done. I know I was last in front of the council, I believe it was the end of November, so just a little update. Um, so since so November to now, we've been doing negotiation of contracts with the suppliers that would be able to um, uh, provide service and want to bid on the program. Um, we've been seeking to continue to evaluate market conditions, like with the volatility that's there, relying on our experience in Massachusetts, how have the bids gone there, the renewals gone, uh, what sort of pricing are we seeing from our suppliers, um, and also, once again, the facilitation of, this, of these policies so that they are in place, we're ready to go. And so now is the period where we're seeking to finalize those contracts. Um, I know I've already shared, a, a, we've done a couple of versions back and forth with the, with the solicitor, um, as well as the solicitors and all of the other communities to get these, thing, to get these contracts final. Um, working within each one of these communities before the councils or their purchasing boards to talk about this authorization to actually select the supplier, um, and then to actually run the bid. And while it says June 7th or June 8th right there, the answer to that is actually June 8th. Um, we were trying to get everything in place to run the bid tomorrow. There's a couple pieces that we wanted to make sure uh, that we finalize and give the suppliers an opportunity to finish with the contracts and have that in front of them before they issue pricing. So they've asked us for another day. Um, and our expectation now is to actually go to bid on Wednesday of this week. Um, and just to give a look into the future, assuming that the bids are acceptable to us, and I'll go through the criteria in just a moment, we would be aiming for an October launch, which coincides when the rate change is going to happen with last resort service. Um, and prior to that, we would be, once again, there's going to be the education opt out of the education um, period, the education and opt out period, I apologize. Um, which is to make sure that we reach out to the community, we do direct mailings, we have the community events, uh, marketing materials, website, social media in place. Everybody's going to have a, about a 33-day period in which they can opt out of the program before it ever starts so that they never have to participate. 
Um, and then that ends roughly mid-September, if I get the date right. We're going to be done with that about mid-September so that the enrollment is complete for uh, when meters are read in October, people would change over to this as a default supply. So that's the timeline that we're working at. So the edu if this is approved and we get a successful bid, um, the real on-the-ground boots work of the education outreach will begin uh, really about early to mid, about early August is when we'll start um, with that with that. Uh, firm period beginning about mid August to the end of uh, mid August to mid September. Next time I'm gonna have a calendar in front of me so I can like know what dates I'm working with. Um, if we go to the next slide, I'm almost done here. Uh, what's in front of you today is once again the bid bid is being planned for Wednesday the eighth. Um, the proposed resolution has a couple of key pieces of it. The first one is we need a signatory, somebody to actually sign the contract and have the authority of you all behind to, to do so. With these electricity supply contracts, the bids that we get are executable for maybe an hour. Um, with the volatility and electricity pricing, they do not hold the prices for long periods of time. They say, we can we can provide service at this rate, but you're going to have to agree with us now. Uh, you're going to have to accept it now because at that moment, they are going to go out to the market and uh, place their orders, essentially. It's a commodity. It's a futures commodity. They're going to have to go and place those orders at, the at that time. They can't wait for a long period of time because the market will continue to change. So we're asking for the authorization for the town manager to sign that contract, assuming that the uh, following conditions are met. The first one is that in order for us to consider the bids responsive, um, it's going to have to be lower than the current, the rate that they provide is going to have to be lower than the current forecasted rate for October. Um, I'll go into what those numbers are in a second. I have a uh, chart for it. And also that the, the solicitor signs off on the contract that it is what it purports to be um, and that it's going to deliver exactly what we what we said it, it will. Um, we have a, just a little bit of work to finish that. And I've, I know I've got the solicitor's feedback on it th thus far. And I'll let him know right now that he'll probably see a final version of it tomorrow morning when we get the uh, we have a, a rec purchase agreement that identifies who are we buying the recs from to service the program, special for the optional additional um, recs. That is included in the contracts. So we have full transparency of where we're purchasing them from. And that agreement just has to be finalized so that we can get the entire contract complete. Um, and so the, that, the important piece there is that responsive is about what's that pricing level. So Phil, if we can just do that last slide here, just wanted to give a, a, a sense of context of what we're talking about. Um, this is a, a rough history of National Grid's last resort service pricing. You can see for October, we're about to climb a little bit of a mountain here. And I apologize, this is a little hard to read. Um, but what the forecast, the, these forecasts are provided by National Grid has filed these with um, the Public Utilities Commission. They've asked questions about what do they expect pricing to be. And they provided this estimate. The, the low end of this estimate is if the last procurement they do is an average of all the procurements they've done thus far. That's the low, the low one. The higher rate is like if this is um, uh, if if the last procurement they do is essentially the price at the time that they asked the question, um, which was if I remember correctly, it was mid April is when they asked that question. So if the final procurement is about the price that they had then, that's the price that they expect. Um, and so we're looking at that range of 15.1 cents to 16.8 cents per kilowatt hour. And so what we're what we've told the suppliers to do is that the bid is only going to be considered responsive if they bring in a rate that's below that 15.1 cents. Um, and so that's that that's that mark of it has to beat that. And for us, that include that's going to include not just the base rate, but also the additional 10% of renewable energy that we would have in that default service. Those numbers together have to come in below that for us to consider it responsive and uh, available for us to even accept it. And the intention is on that bid day is that for the six communities that are doing this, we all reach agreement. We're all gonna reach agreement on the supplier to, to select as well as the term length. Um, we've been doing pricing with them from one to three years. And so we're gonna see some rate options that that fit that model. Um, and we would select the term uh, that we think is has the, that provides us the best value um, over the over a period of time so that we would get a single rate for one, two, maybe three years. So though I'll tell you now that I expect it to be more of a one to two year period. Um, the idea being that with this volatility, perhaps we want to go out and do this again in two years after we see some stability in the in the prices so we know what the new normal might be. So once again, that request then is for us to have um, once again the solicitor give final review and sign off of the contract. Bids to come in responsive, as in they are lower than the lowest forecasted rate. Um, and then we would execute a contract on Wednesday uh, to begin service in October. Happy to answer any questions that you might have. And I, I fear going well into the weeds on electricity supply, but only if you ask me. <laughs>
So I'm curious, um, yeah. how many bidders do you expect? Uh, we've been in communication with three suppliers up to this point. Um, I cannot guarantee that all three of them will come into uh, and actually provide a bid on that day. Um, we've seen, we've had up to four suppliers interested in Massachusetts and only two bids come back. Um, once again, they are also hedging their bets because of the volatility in the market and whether they can deliver under these terms. So we've been had interest from three. Um, for us, we feel it's necessary to, if we get one, then we will at least evaluate them on the terms that they provide. Mm -hmm. And um, and if you get one, and it's maybe it's just barely below, um, just just barely uh, qualified bid. Yeah. Um, is there still the opportunity to reject it if if you feel yes we can do it again? Okay. Yep. Yeah. And so um, I mean that the decision to make that while every individual every community has the opportunity to reject it if they so choose and not move forward with the rest of the group, the rest of the communities that are, are doing the buying as a buying group. Um, and what we would do in that case is that we'd probably come back to you and try to identify a new time to go out to bid. Um, no guarantees it would be as successful as now. Of course, it could also be more successful. Uh, in a couple, I do not know mm -hmm. uh, exactly what the future would hold, but yes, the opportunity would be there to reject it. Um, although that decision was, we're essentially asking Mr. Hervey here to help make that decision um, in conjunction with the other communities that are there. And then obviously we'll provide our input. Okay. Um, so uh, because some folks may feel like they're joining this in the middle, um, of course, if I can kind of take you through some questions and let me know if I'm, I'm but, right on these. And <laughs> by all means. So uh, when anybody gets their electricity bill, a portion of that is just the delivery charge. Yes. In fact, isn't that the larger side? Of usually, the usually, although I would say that if we end up paying 16 cents per kilowatt hour, maybe it won't be the largest right. percentage right. anymore. So, uh, but yes. And, um, and the, uh, so one portion of it is the electricity. So you, the electricity can be bought from various places and people are, are already buying from different, um, different sources than national grid. That's right. That's right. Rhode Island energy. Rhode Island energy. Rhode Island Energy provides the default. So if you don't pick anything, you get Rhode Island Energy, which is the rates that you showed on that slide. That's right. Right. And there, um, the the sort of minimum renewables in Rhode Island right now is what, 20? 19%. 19%. And it has been going up one and a half percent, although there's legislation that should have final passage tomorrow that's going to see much more significant increases okay. year over year. And and so the idea for folks is that um, we would, using the power of the six communities uh, and that purchasing power, try to negotiate better rates with electricity suppliers so that we can do two things, reduce our electricity costs, mm -hmm. but also increase the opportunity to make sort of green choices. Yeah, so that a, a greater percentage of the electricity provided is being offset by renewable energy credits. So it's which indicate that a megawatt of power of electricity was put onto the grid from a renewable source, wind, solar, and the like. Um, and what are the, what are the options that we will be uh, offering folks in terms of a percentage of renewable yes. as compared to what they currently have if you're in the default? Yeah, so the right now the default service is, as, as you mentioned, 19, is 19%. Um, the program would be offering four products uh, to the community. The default would be um, the 19, that would be 29% this year, um, which gets us to the, the minimum plus 10%. And that's that price to compare the one that has to be under last resort service. There'd be an opt-down product, which would just have the state minimum amount of renewable energy so that every bit of savings that we're able to, uh, that we're able to generate from the program is delivered in the form of a lower rate rather than offset by buying more renewable energy. And then there's two opt-up products, a 50% where half of all of your electricity usage is offset by renewable energy credits, and then 100% renewable product as well. And those are opt-up. Uh, for anybody, any, somebody would have to make an affirmative choice to select those products. Right. And so that, that folks understand, um, if, you, if you are currently on the default with Rhode Island Energy uh, and you do nothing, you will be moved over to this program. Um, you will have a default of 29% renewable versus 19. Mm -hmm. But you'll have the option to go down to 19 or go up to as much as 100. That's right. 
And you'll have the option to just default and stay, uh, just to opt out completely of this and go to um, National Rhode Island right. Energy's um, uh, program. Yes, and and just to be, and once again, just to be clear uh, of this is that, uh, yes, somebody can opt out before the program starts to either back to Rhode Island Energy, or they could go to any other competitive supplier, any other company out there that provides electricity. All those options are available. None of them are taken away. Um, and the process, and also after the program launches, anybody can opt out of the program without any fee. There's no cost uh, to, the, to the individual. So they can leave the program at any time that they want at no cost. And the process for opting out is that we've, we're really gonna try to make it as easy as possible. Everyone's gonna see, receive a self, uh, an address stamped postcard in the mail that I'll have to do the sign and send back to opt out. There'll be a form on the website that we're putting together. They'll be attached to the town website that allow them to opt out online. Um, they can also call the, the supplier that we choose, or we'll have a customer service line for the program, all the programs together. They can call that. Um, they can also call Rhode Island Energy. They have the ability to opt somebody out of the program or bring them back to last resort service. And also if somebody says, actually, I want to go over to that company over there, the process of enrolling with them would opt them out of the program as well. So, um, and that can happen by phone call. It can happen by uh, online form. It can happen by mail. We want to make sure all the options are available and they're all equally good to us. Okay. Um, so I've asked a lot of questions, council members, questions? Yes. I don't have President. any questions, just a, just a comment. Um, that was a great presentation and I just wanna thank you for all the work that you've put in because this is a wonderful opportunity and it looks like from what you've presented, you've done an excellent job in terms of what you're presenting here in terms of getting lower supply rate, um, cleaner, and less volatility. All three of those things are absolutely huge. So thank, thank you. you. Right. Okay. Um, does anybody from the public have a question about this program? Yes, okay. TR, please. Totally oh. <laughs> I was <laughs> Rhode Island Energy taking over National Grid? Yes. So that's the new name. That's the new utility, yes. So all your renewable energy that National Grid has coming in from solar panels and all that is bought direct to National Grid as it stands now because you can't use your renewable energy to supply your house. I'm going to have to, because of my lack of knowledge on how uh, Rhode Island Energy works, I, I can't comment on them purchasing electricity. I don't know about the contracts. Yeah between generators and them. So when you go out to bid, you're gonna bid from a different source. Mm. Does National Grid or whoever it is that owns all the wires, because you don't see all these other companies coming in and putting in their own wires. Right. Does it work out to be like a, a tax on the wires? So for the each, bill? Each, I'm sorry, each uh, yeah. individual supplier, are they getting taxed? No. Or so no, the so uh, Rhode Island Energy um, has the the right to own and operate the wires themselves, but they essentially where the electricity comes from, like its actual source, is once again I don't want to go too far into the details, but let's say there's a there's a whole entity out there called ISO New England whose responsibility is to make sure that there is enough electricity on the grid at all times so that when you turn on your lights, your lights turn on. Now where that electricity comes from is a long so there's a long list of generators both in our region in New England and, and outside of it. Um, but the electricity that you have, like it's running through these lamps right now, I couldn't tell you the source because all the electrons look the same. So what their job is, is to make sure that there's always enough electricity on the grid at every time to make sure our lights turn on so that the renewable energy credits is a way that we're able to identify how much of the electricity that we used was actually delivered by a renewable energy generator, even though the electron itself might not be the one getting to your house. It's been put on the grid to reflect your usage. Did that make sense? Basically, it's a conglomerate of everybody supplying. Yes. So if I don't go it all gets with mixed renewable in. energy and I go with Eversource out of me, who's going to know what power is coming into my house because it's all coming on the same line? Yeah, there's actually, as far as I can tell, unless somebody knows something I, I don't, okay. there's no way to know exactly which power generator. Mm -hmm. I, we could, if you want, we can go outside. We could talk about this for a number of hours. Um, but the, the answer is uh, like how the power gets to you is going to stay the same, except that it's 
Rhode Island Energy instead of National Grid. But you're going to have one bid at a low, one guy at a medium, another guy at a high, but they're all coming together. Yes. On the same line. That's they're all coming together. They all eventually come together and to power the grid as a whole. But you you brought up so many. I sorry. I could go, I could go on. <laughs> China. Yeah, it's a. I, I will I will tell you that. Uh, the utility structure and how electricity is both generated and delivered to our homes is a complicated system. There are good things about it. There are things that if I could wave my magic wand, I would change about it, um, but that is not my authority. The But the goal here, as uh, Councilman Hum brought up, is that how can we make, like the goals of this is like, can we get more stable rates than ones that change every six months? Is there a way through a competitive process, like going out to the competitive market rather than relying on our utility and our agencies to do procurements, if we go out to the competitive market on our own, can we do better than what that, that method is? And then finally is, can we make it more renewable? Can we actually bring in more renewables onto the grid at a lower price? And our experience has been yes, um, as long as you do it carefully. But thank you for your questions. Any other questions from here? Are there questions online, Phil? I don't see anybody hand raised. Okay. Um, Questions or comments from the council? Okay. Um, I'll make a motion to approve the resolution authorizing the town manager to execute an electricity supply agreement to provide electricity supply for Barrington's community aggregation program. Is there seconded by Councilor Breyer? Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And no abstentions. Thank you. Thank you. And thank and you, Jamie. I appreciate it. It's complicated, but it's, I truly enjoy this in my own way. Um, <laughs> it's just an odd thing. Uh, and, and to be sure that the results of this, obviously, the town manager will know immediately, but we'll make sure a report comes to the council uh, afterwards and all of our contracts get to file with the Public Utilities Commission so that it all ends up being public. Great. Excellent. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, the ne next item on our agenda is to discuss an act on the Rhode Island Cannabis Act legislation. Um, we've gotten some emails on this. We had a good workshop uh, on this as a council last week. Um, and just so that I can kind of um, set the table for, for discussion, um, uh, the state of Rhode Island last week, last week, um, legalized the sale of recreational cannabis. Um, it had already been decriminalized a little bit uh, a while ago, but now like Massachusetts, Colorado, and, and a lot of other states are starting to, it actually legalized the sale of recreational cannabis. So it's legal in Rhode Island and there's nothing we can do about it as a town. It, it is already legal in Massachusetts uh, in the, the towns that border us. Um, the question um, for tonight is whether we might allow the sale in Barrington, um, retail sale and, and some other things in Barrington, um, or whether we would seek to opt out. If we as a council do nothing, then it's automatically by state law uh, legal in, in the state of Rhode Island, I mean, in the, in the town of Barrington, if we do nothing. If we say we wanna put it on the ballot, we, then it is up to the voters in the, in the town of Barrington to decide whether they want to, on a referendum in November, um, it would be November, yeah. Um, uh, reject the idea of having the sale within Barrington. There's nothing we can do about the use within Barrington. It's just whether we have um, the sale within Barrington. Um, the, the other piece of this uh, that I think is important that we talk about is that whatever we decide tonight, um, there is still a significant chance that the sale will be legal in Barrington because voters could come in and, and 
tends to be a, a popular uh, issue and there are some financial benefits for the town, the voters could come in and do this. So we need to be ready. And whatever we decide tonight, I think we need to um, prepare for the possibility that it will be um, changed, which will require some substantial changes to our zoning ordinances. Um, so I think, I think those are the two things that we need to address. Whether we as a council um, want to take any action, if we do nothing, it's automatically be legal in Barrington to sell in Barrington. If we, if we um, do take action, then it will be up to the voters to actually decide that in November. So that's, that's kind of setting the table. Uh, Councilor Breyer. I just wanna ask a clarifying question, just to confirm it's, it would be a referendum to prohibit not just the sale, but also the manufacture, the testing, anything related to recreational cannabis. That's right. Uh, it's, it's all in or all out. Right. Um, so you, you, you can't have a store, but not have testing. Um, or you can't prohibit a store and allow a business to open that would just test. Right. It, you either allow all of them yeah. or you forbid all of them. Um, uh, the other the other thing we talked about is the the financial um, incentives. If there is a, a store in Barrington and and there are limited licenses, as we learned, um, it's a pretty big big area that Barrington is in. So that you know we'd be some stiff competition if one of our business owners wanted to to do it. Um, but if we did have that, we would be eligible for 3% tax return, almost like our food and beverage tax that we get for our, our um, restaurants in town. Um, there is also some additional um, uh, funding that we might be eligible for if we allowed it. It doesn't mean we'd get any um, it, it's at the discretion of the state to distribute that those funds, but we would not be eligible for that at all if we forbid it. So might be no additional money out there, but they might have some funding for education or that kind of thing based on tax revenue collected at the state level. Um, so um, any other questions before we start and see if anyone's uh, does anyone who is here, uh, because you guys came out, you should have the first crack at it. Anyone who's here like to say anything about this? Please come forward, Denise. My name is Denise Alves. Um, I live at 135 Foot Street, and I am here as a um, member of the community. Um, and I would just simply like to ask that um, we do put it on referendum. We do let the community um, vote, and I do think we need to prepare either way. I think you're right. Um, I really think what you did last week in having kind of this educational forum, let's start talking about this, was great. And I would actually like to see a few more of those between now and then. And I think between now and then, we will also have more information as the commission gets going. Um, that we can share with the community. And so the community can really make an informed decision. Um, and at the same time, be ready with zoning or you know, whatever else we can do to, um, to put things in place. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Mr. Ramishaitis. Hello again. Um, I'm in favor of you guys not doing anything. Let it go. It's going to happen. We have a one in 16 shot of getting a, a store or one in four because there's 16 zones that we're involved in. We're going to miss out on all this opportunity for tax money, businesses coming into town, people coming into town supporting our businesses. Listen, it's the time of the era now. Our kids is marijuana. 
when I grew up, mine was alcohol. So it's, it's making a whole turn. And it's not as bad as everybody thinks it is. Believe me, I've never seen anybody overdose on marijuana. And I've been on a fire department for almost 40 years. Rescue half of it. So now we're seeing all the opiates where we're using more and more Narcan to bring people around, never with marijuana. So it's not as bad as everybody thinks. I know there's no way of telling if you are sobriety, I believe they're using the same as a DUI, same type of symptoms or a test and all that other stuff. But to miss out on opportunity because people think it's it has that stigma from 1972. You know, it's it's time we all come in. We're all getting into renewable energy, even though the renewable energy, we have no place to get rid of it once it's spent, like car batteries and windmill blades and all that other stuff. It's not going anywhere, and people think it is. But it's time to turn around and come together. But I think you should just let it go. That's totally my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, anyone else here? Please. I'm Sean Ganglani. I live at 85 Upland here in Barrington. I didn't even come here to talk about this today, but um, I agree with everything the gentleman just said, except I, I hope that the town considers, um, yes, nobody ever overdoses on marijuana, but I rode a motorcycle here today and there hasn't been a day that's gone by over the last few years where when I've been out riding, I haven't smelled marijuana. It's not that it's, it's not that I'm just happening to drive by someone's house where they may be using it. It's people using it while they're driving. So yes, people don't overdose, but it's a big problem for driving under the influence. And I also agree with you that I don't know that there's a police police officer out there that has a good approach or resource or something that they can do to help keep us safe against driving under the influence with um, marijuana. So that's, that would be a concern of mine for it coming, coming into Barrington. That's it. Thank you, sir. Yeah. I think that's an excellent point. The, um, the blood alcohol tests that we have are quite good and quite accurate. And we don't have something like that uh, for cannabis unfortunately. Um, and I think that's a very good argument for not legalizing, but it's legal. Um, and we can't do anything about that here. So that the real question is whether we want to have sale in Barrington. Will sale increase the use in Barrington? I don't know. I, and also, to be fair, I, I may be able here, I lost a leg in an accident due to somebody uh, going through a stop sign and they were under the influence. Yeah, those are tough cases to win as we heard from uh, our police chief last week because they're, uh, they're observation cases and, and the um, uh, police officer has to come in and testify as to what the person was doing. They're all over the road. And then I looked at them, their eyes were glassy, their eyes, you know, and, and there's, it's harder to do than with, you know, the, the blood alcohol tests, the breathalyzer. Um, okay, anyone else from here? Um, is there anyone online? I see a hand raised, Kristen Westmoreland. Okay, Dr. Miss Westmoreland. Hi, good evening. Um, Kristen Westmoreland, yes, 115 Alfred Drown. Um, I just wanted to thank you, uh, as Denise said, for holding the public workshop last week. And I also hope that there'll be more opportunities for public input and education. And I would also support putting this on the ballot. I've talked to people on both sides, people who are unsure. I think that, you know, there's there's some more education to be done and, and putting it out to vote would be uh, a good way to um, to make a, a decision of this magnitude. And then I, I'd also like to put my Bay team hat on for a second and um, just suggest a language choice that we refer to um, legalization as adult use instead of recreational. Recreational has a little bit of a, 
more kind of promoting, um, it, it, you know, kind of implies like promoting usage to our youth. So um, just in terms of protecting uh, our youth uh, from my prevention standpoint, um, I would just recommend the, uh, the verbiage using uh, adult use instead of recreational. It's a fair point. Thank you. Thanks. Um, anyone else online? At this point, I don't see any more hands raised. Okay, unless there's anyone else. Oh, please. Yes, absolutely. I hear this so much. And, you know, I, I've worked with alcohol for years. Um, I worked for Mothers Against Drunk Driving for years. And, you know, so totally understand. And, and law enforcement is very frustrated that we don't have the tools we need. Um, but I hear a lot exactly what you said, that um, we don't get overdoses on marijuana. You're right. You're not going to. Because it does not affect the same receptors in our brains that opioids do. They affect different receptors and they cause overdoses. Marijuana doesn't. It, will, it won't cause overdoses. You might get very, very sick. It's not gonna cause an overdose. So I just hear that all the time in, in, in this comparison of it's not that bad because it doesn't cause overdoses. But, and I don't have the statistics right now in front of me, um, but a lot of times what happens is young people that start to use marijuana early and the more they use, they're your opioid users later. That's what happens. Um, the, the attorney general's office um, put out this really wonderful um, video that they've shown around the state and I'm lacking the name of it right now. Um, and it, it went through um, people that had been, you know, using opioids and and who who had the struggle with them. Um, and most of them were probably in their 30s, I'd say, maybe 40s, maybe a couple 25. And what I noticed is every time every new person that was in that video, their first drug was marijuana. That's where they started. So no, they're not gonna die. You are not gonna have them on your rescue, dying and need to give them Narcan. It's just not gonna happen. It doesn't mean it's not as bad. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I completely agree. Mm -hmm. Mindset, I completely agree with that. Then everything. Amen. Okay. Uh, any further questions, comments online? No more, no more hands raised, no, no chat, nothing. Okay. Uh, so I'll close public comment. Um, um, I'll just give you my own view uh, is that it's, it's legal in the state of Rhode Island. It's legal in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, uh, right over the border from us. So it's here. And uh, there are arguments that we can make about not making it legal, but those are, you know, that chip has sailed. Um, I, I do think that uh, because it is legal and will be regulated, um, that we ought to give our business community an opportunity to take advantage of this. Um, whether we get any of those um, is, is anyone's guess. Um, we could say we'll leave it to the, the voters. Um, I think the voters are going to find this way anyway. Uh, and there'll be a lot of kind of Durham and Strang as we get there. But um, I do think they're going to find this way anyway. So I would, I would be prepared to do nothing. Uh, and that's kind of how I feel about this in terms of placing this on the referendum. But open it up to anyone else who wants to comment. Please. Um, I think it is a whole new world. It is adult use. It's not recreational use in the adult recreational use versus um, <clears throat> recreational use. 
I think that we have an opportunity if we do put it on as a referendum to the town. We have a great opportunity for greater citizen engagement. We have a good opportunity for educational opportunities. We have um, a framework that happens that the Bay team can have their conversations. Um, the police can have their conversations. Um, the business leaders can have their conversations. And I think it becomes much more of a community buy-in as opposed to us not doing anything and, and likely not to TR's point, likely not getting a um, license because there are so few of them. But at least if we have the structure to say, in the next few months, we will have this opportunity, we do get that community conversation going. And in some ways that to me is more critical than whether or not we have a license and whether or not we have um, the sale. I agree, we I think benefiting from the revenue would be terrific. I don't know that that's necessarily gonna come our way um, given the limited number of licenses, but I do think we need to prepare ourselves as a community for how our children are going to react, how parents can have conversations, how if adults are using and it's legal, how that engages with their children and how um, neighbors can have better conversations. I think it's a really good opportunity for community engagement and education. And I also think that it puts the onus of the decision on the community as opposed to us not doing anything or doing or making a decision to to not do anything. So um, I, I'm supportive of putting it on um, a ballot in November, but also preparing as a community with zoning, with education, um, and, and really taking this up. I think the legalization, although we knew it was coming, came very quickly. And this gives us a nice opportunity to prepare ourselves for what, how we manage it going forward. Vice President Hunt. Thank you. Um, I think that was very well said by Ms. Conway. Um, and I, just to get it out, I, I feel the same way. Um, I mean, if I were to vote on the issue in terms of you know whether we were to actually have one tonight or not, um, and I always reserve my right to change, but I would vote to have the opportunity to 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 have a, a retail store in town and um, and have the town take advantage of some of the benefits um, that would come with this law. Um, but I, I this one doesn't feel like it's it's a decision that we should be making on our own tonight. Uh, we've talked in our, our prior meetings about the community engagement and the importance of it. So that's why I'm glad Ms. Conway mentioned that. And I'm glad Ms. Alves mentioned that as well. Um, you know, I, I, this is something that, um, you know, we, we have a very engaged community. Um, we have a community that uh, for the most part does stay up to speed on current events and, and what's going on. And this is brand new to, to not just Barrington, but to Rhode Island. And given um, how new it is, how potentially polarizing it is, um, how we don't have, I think, sufficient feedback to make a decision ourselves today, frankly, I don't think there's been enough community engagement for us this, you know, to speak on behalf of everybody in town. I've had conversations in the last week with people who've shocked me in terms of how they've come out on this uh, both ways. So that to me, you know, continues to tell me that there, there's more discussion to be had, more work to be done. Um, if it goes to a vote, I hope it would vote to give us that opportunity. But I think this is one that that I think we should put forward to a referendum and, and let the whole town decide. Okay, Councilor Breyer. So I have um, I'm I'm in total agreement about the importance of community engagement, and uh, I have concerns about the the public health impacts of legalization. <coughs> I have I have concern about a referendum um kind of falling victim to misinformation we've heard during the workshop and and um, from other folks who have reached out at least to me and, and to all of us in some cases a lot of the focus on the negative aspects related to legalization as opposed to the impact of whether or not there's a retail or a testing or a manufacturing business in town and i worry that um the a referendum would be more about people's view on legalization as opposed to uh, retail business. And um, for, for that reason, I, I think I, I see a clear benefit to the business community and to the town of allowing um, licenses to, to be available for Barrington business owners, 
So I would be opposed to putting it on a referendum. Is there a drum roll? <laughs> <laughs> I, I do agree with, with uh, Vice President Hum and Councillor Conway. I, I did say before that if this, is, if this is a kind of issue I think that is perfect for a referendum because it's a binary issue and it's it, it, you can really have a list of pros and a list of cons and people can make that determination. This isn't something that has a lot of technicality or technical knowledge or, or, or nuance or, or where you need a resolution with, with several sub paragraphs. I think this is something that, that goes to several issues. One, the public health impact. Two, um, I am concerned about some of the reluctance we heard from our police chief as well. In his citation of the Colorado study, um, there is some indication that, that, that it may cause increased use, increased traffic accidents, things like that. And there's an argument within town to be had about whether you would want the increased traffic or not. We're in no way depriving um, citizens or residents of Barrington of, of, of use because there are dispensaries quite nearby. Um, and so I'm not concerned about that. And, and some of the arguments for decriminalization involved criminal justice, equity, socioeconomic, racial and ethnic equity in criminal justice. Um, and the fact that it wasn't, they aren't, we weren't dealing with crimes of violence. And so I, I think in that sense, um, although I completely support decriminalization, um, I think when you bring it into a community, you have to decide whether, like other types of businesses, you either want a very strict zoning or maybe even no such business at all and that a community should be able to make that choice for itself. There's the other issue of the effects of it. I think we assume, and, I, and it may well be right, that there are positive economic benefits, positive benefits to tax revenue, positive benefits to the business community. That's not necessarily true. There, there is some evidence at least, and it may be just correlation and not causation, that when you have dispensaries, you tend to maybe have a negative impact on the area around, or at least that they tend to, to be in, in economic, economically struggling areas. And that, it makes me think about sort of what kind of a tenant do you want in your, in your buildings? Um, some people will have a completely different vision if they see a nice cafe going versus a vape shop, for example. And that is because of the spillover effect and the potential of that. I think this is the discussion that the community can have. And, and we have a, a moderately progressive community, a very thoughtful community. And I, I, I trust us to have a rewarding public discussion. The issue of misinformation was also brought up in at least one email that I received today. And I, and I understand that. I agree with that. But that's just generally a problem with democracy at all levels, you know, and, and that's always going to be an issue. And how we combat that is about how we present and, and delve into ideas. And so I, I, that is less of a concern for me. I, I think that this is something that, that the voters of Barrington deserve to decide. And, and maybe the concept of, of the character of a community is a quaint concept. Um, but that's another factor. We can decide what kind of town do we want to be. And, and, and this may have an impact on, on the kind of businesses that we want to encourage, the kind of tenants we want to encourage, and also um, just generally the, the, the tenor of the community. I think, I think it would make sense for, for voters to weigh in on that. And I don't think that I, I'm in a position where I want to substitute my, my judgment on that. If we were talking about something where, where I had a, a specialized knowledge or something more technical, something more complicated, um, or something that really wasn't amenable to a ballot question, I would have a different view. But here, I think I think it makes sense to go to the voters. Okay. Um, was there further discussion? Does anyone want to make a motion? Sure. Sure. When would be the last possible time to put this on a referendum? I need to have the question to the Secretary of State um by august usually around august 4th through the 6th around that time so our next meeting is july 25th so would it be feasible to have postpone the vote or whatever for tonight and have a couple of community engagements 
and then maybe bring it up by the end of July and do a referendum or a non-referendum. The more you get, maybe it'll sway your positions. I have no idea, but it's just the thought process in my head. Yeah. Um, we we did have a workshop already, which you came to. Um, you know, people have been saying, you know, they want to get more community involved and talk about it before a referendum. Mm -hmm. But if you talk about it before, maybe we don't even have to put it on a referendum. Yeah. Kind of see what I'm... I do. I do. Um, I'm not sure how much is, is going to change in terms of the way that the council looks at it, because I think... Uh, my colleagues are not saying that they are opposed to the idea, but rather that they think the voters should make that decision. And I don't think more information for them uh, would change it. I don't mean to speak for you, but it, that's to me, it sounds like that's what you're you're saying. So, well, I, I think also the the workshop, and I watched the video. I was I wasn't able to be here for that. Um, I mean, th that was an indication that there is some split within the community, and also. An indication that you know we didn't get the kind of engagement I think you're going to get when people say, "Hey, I'm I'm a voter. I, I'm going to decide this," and I think that that may yield a higher level of engagement. And uh, and I, I think we're all open to that discussion for sure. If there's a market, I, I tend to think that that um, and voters decide that they that they would like a dispensary here. I think we'll we'll eventually get one. I, I we don't have to necessarily be in the first round of licenses. These are likely to expand, and then as market conditions change, they'll close and open and move. Um, I don't know that we have to be first in line necessarily. And if we're if this is jeopardizing that in any way, that even even that is an open question. I think the most important thing is that that voters have that have have that choice. Okay. Just a thought. Sure. Does anyone want to make a motion? I'll, I'll move. Um, I move to approve the resolution authorizing a referendum to be held on the issuance of cannabis licenses within the town, such referendum to be submitted to the electors of the town at the general election to be held on November 8th, 2022. Motion's been made. Is there a second? Second. Motion made and seconded. Uh, further discussion? Can I just ask a sure. Um, I actually am in favor of motion two, the draft in motion two, to direct the planning board and to draft zone, zoning ordinance amendments regulating cannabis related uses, including facilities cultivation, subject to voters approving a referendum. So basically merging the two, but just with the addition of the zoning. Well, I think we can vote on the second one um after this okay. so okay. so we'll definitely okay. take up the second I, one because I, I will support that second motion as well just so you know you've okay. got the votes yes. for that yeah. Yeah. yeah all right okay motion made and second further discussion all those in favor aye, aye. aye. any opposed aye. Nay. nay so there are uh three in favor two opposed and no abstentions that motion carries uh, so that will be on the ballot on November 8th. So then the next one uh, that we've talked about, and I don't know that we need that much discussion because it's just a, um, a just in case kind of thing, uh, would be directing our um, planning board or, and our solicitor to work with the planning board to draft zoning ordinance amendments uh, regulating cannabis related uses um, and th this is in case it passes, in case the referendum in November, the town's people say we we do want a retail uh, establishment or testing and, and testing uh, and manufacture in Barrington. If that passes, then we're going to need changes to our zoning amendment. So we can do this as a, you know, to be set in motion if that that passes. Uh, any discussion on that? Just clarification. We are able to do that regard in preparation for the passage, right? It doesn't. We don't need to wait until the passing to. That's right. Yes. Okay. That's, that's I just wanted idea. to confirm that. The advice is to put that in place ahead of time. Yes. So if that license is lined up the next day, the zoning will yes, be set. It's already done. Yep. Thank you. So I would make one 
modification to this motion um, just to say in, in retail where it says retail sale, I would add uh, and including uh, medical marijuana zoning because we have zoning already for medical marijuana. And um, my understanding is that that would have to change because we, we don't allow for the um, dispensaries in Barrington for medical marijuana right now. That is correct. If the voters approve retail, medical would then be allowed, yes. Okay, so go ahead, please. I, I have a question too, probably for Mr. Ursillo. Um, and I'm, I'm sure we've talked about this before, so apologies, but in terms of um, the, one point of feedback that I've received over um, the time that we've had discussion on this is, um, you know, what, what opportunities does the town have for um, public use in terms of um, regulation or anything along those lines? Because it, people have raised concerns in terms of people abusing um correct you know out out in the open or uh, i don't know i just want you, to explore you that would be able to prohibit its use in all public spaces and you could also develop a policy for all your employees with regard to obviously not using it while working and with regard to public health and safety employees they have to be they clean for 24 hours prior to coming to work so we can get all that in place and help um Put that together as we move forward. Okay. No, thank you. I, I don't. I don't know what my position on that is, but I, I'd, I'd ask that the zoning board at least explore that as part of their discussions. Thank you. Anything further? Okay. Well, I'll make a motion to direct the planning board to work with the solicitor to draft zoning ordinance amendments relating to regulating cannabis-related uses, including facilities for cultivation, manufacture, testing and retail sales and including uh, medical marijuana dispensaries and related uses. Subject to voters approving a referendum in November allowing for the issuance of cannabis licenses within Barrington. So a motion's been made is, do you want me to go over that again? Can you just repeat my, um, uh, President Carroll and including miracle marijuana dispensaries and what was the end? And related uses. <clears throat> and then what's in the draft subject to approval. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? Second. Seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And no abstention, that motion carries. <laughs> okay, uh, next item on our agenda is to discuss an act on a landlord consent and cell tower lease agreement. This is, um, from my review, this is a simple kind of assignment of lease that, that as landlord, we, um, we have to uh, approve, but we probably have something in the lease that says that we can't uh, unreasonably withhold consent. Yes, um, it's pro forma. So um, I'll make a motion to approve a landlord consent and release agreement transferring and assigning the existing lease on the town owned cell tower at 100 Federal Road as requested by T Mobile. Is second. there a second? Second. Motion made and seconded. Further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And no abstentions. That motion carries. Uh, next item on our agenda is. Um, uh, to discuss an act on restrooms at uh, town athletic fields. Vice President Hung. Yeah, thank you. I'm gonna remove my mask if that's okay, President Carroll. Sure, just while sure. I speak. Um, so thanks for uh, for placing this on the agenda. Um, this is something that's on tonight's agenda. I think more, more for informational purposes, although I'm, I'm gonna propose a vote to go with it. Um, but what, the issue is, um, the restroom facilities at our town's athletic fields. And um, whether they're permanent facilities, uh, porta potties, whatever, whatever there may be, um, there are issues with the lack of, of these types of facilities. And this issue came up to me first um, from a coach of a youth sports team. It was a male coach coaching a third and fourth grade uh, girls lacrosse team. And practice after practice, he was having issue with his players needing to go to the bathroom and there were no restroom facilities at the fields. And he's sending eight and nine-year-old girls into the woods to go to the bathroom 
and he felt remarkably uncomfortable. And he said, this isn't right. Um, this, we, I, why, why is it like this in our town? And other people have raised that as an issue. Um, I've been a coach before. I've sent kids into the woods at other fields. I'll admit it. Um, that's not right. Um, there have been issues raised with respect to uh, teams coming from other towns. So somebody's coming from Portsmouth or Bristol or wherever, and they've traveled their way. And somebody, either a player, spectator, whoever it is, has to use the restroom, and we have no facilities. And what the town does right now is uh, – I think the leagues, and I'm, I probably don't have all the information on this, but the leagues can can rent uh, portable facilities, but it's on the league's dime and it's on the league's liability and responsibility. So let's say there's a shared field between lacrosse, soccer, maybe some other sports. Um, one league pays for it. The other league, maybe they say, nope, we're not going to pay for it. So then the league who pays for it either opens it up to everybody, you know, taking on the risk that somebody could deface it or who knows what might happen at their dime. Um, the other league getting to use it for free or locking it when they're not using it. And um, an example of that actually just came up recently. I, I was at one of my son's soccer games and I was at Chinesi and Chinesi has a, a permanent restroom facility. And that permanent restroom facility is always locked. I frankly, I've never been inside of it and it's been there for a long, long time. Um, so we're at a, so we're at a soccer game and there's a permanent restroom facility and next to it are two, um, porta potties and a parent of one of the players has a three-year-old child with her as well. And all of a sudden I see her running with this child, like a football under her arm sprinting. And, and I say, where, where, where are you going? And she says, all three of those bathrooms are locked. I got to run home because my child, my three-year-old has to go to the bathroom. To me, that's unacceptable. Um, I think as a town, we can do better than that um, to provide comfort at our athletic facilities. Um, so that's a little bit of background about this. Um, I've done rough numbers subject to perhaps further discussion, um, you know, by some boards or, or by the council or whatever it may be. Um, I'm told that it's uh, $120 per month to rent a portable uh, restroom, a, a porta potty um, per location. So just my own simple math, and I'm not very good at math, but um, three months in the fall for youth sports, three months in the spring, maximum six months, $120 a pop. By my count, which subject to check upon further review, I think there's a maximum of 10 fields that we would probably use these porta potties at. And I'd say probably less, probably closer to seven to 10. But if you take the maximum numbers, given those stats, it comes out to $7,200 for the course of the year for the town to provide this type of service, um, which I, in my opinion, I think the town should do. Um, so that's my long-winded way of saying, um, I think we should explore this. I think we should explore it before the fall season so that if this is something that's approved, um, the fall uh, recreational participants um, and spectators can take advantage of it. Um, so what I'm proposing is, uh, that we refer it to the parks and rec department, who's already taking a look at it, but ask them to, um, to provide a, a vote and recommendation, um, by our July 25th meeting, uh, and also public works and the school department, uh, to get feedback and recommendations from those groups, um, because all of them are involved. And, uh, I'd ask that we make a vote on this at our July 25th meeting so that whatever we decide, if it's approved it be in place uh for the fall sports season so um i'll stop i'll see if there are any questions but i'll take it from there i don't have any questions please no, i absolutely i've been in the same situation as a coach i i certainly acknowledge and the lead the the need and uh, and appreciate you know you're, you're taking the lead on this for sure absolutely it's needed i'd be interested if it's part of the um the field rental or field use that some of the leagues would be willing to contribute a, a small portion of their fees. To your point, there are a lot of children who are spending a good amount of money to play in these sports and they should be comfortable, but I do think there should be an element of, um, of support from some of the leagues as well to, to contribute to it. But yeah, yes, thank I you. And, and, and thanks for that comment. I, I, I can give you some feedback on that, again, subject to further um, review from the boards. Um, I am aware. So the, the, the field that this started at was the middle school. Um, 
And it, it, I say, sorry, it's always been an issue, but where it kind of really came to this coach that I mentioned, who was very uncomfortable, um, started at the middle school and uh, it's lacrosse. And uh, they asked for uh, a porta potty at the middle school and it sounded reasonable. So um, the league, I think, was granted permission to, to put a porta potty there. Um, but it could only be in a certain location, um, just kind of given the dimensions of the field, the lighting and things along those lines. And the middle school raised an issue because it's such a multi-use field. So it has um, uh, soccer, lacrosse, baseball. There's a basketball court, tennis, um, pickleball, and um, anybody else just traipsing through the middle school. So this league had asked uh, other leagues to help them and were declined which was within their right to do. So this league had to take it upon itself to say, well, we're not going to, you know, put a porta potty there that a basketball player might use at some point and not respect it. Or a soccer player might tell us we're not going to pay for it. And then, you know, their players and probably coaches and other people are going to use it as well. Um, so to me, I, I understand the, um, the leagues having some skin in the game as well, but I think, you know, when, when people come to the town sports field, they are they are the town's sports fields, regardless of what league is using them. So I think the town can kind of take some ownership, um, provide some comfort, provide this level of service at what I think are are pretty minimal costs um, no, over the course of the year. Agree. I just think as part of potentially as part of a con I I don't know enough about what the contracts are that the leagues um when they rent the fields, but to to have some sort of additional contribution, I just it just would be. I think it, it's a service the town provides, but they also would benefit from it. And I think it would just be helpful if maybe if they rent the fields for $100, maybe it's 120 or something to that effect. I, I'm just throwing numbers out, but, um, and I, I agree. I don't think it should be one, one league or another because you do get that ownership, but that they should be shared. Mm -hmm. It's just a little bit of a contribution. Thank you. I think there's time to, uh, before our July meeting to really, start thinking about places you talked about the middle school that might be a place where you want multiple you know additional um, units because it's just so heavily used whereas maybe chinese would be fewer um, so something for parks and rec to consider um, and uh, dpw and, and the schools Councilor Brian. Um, I, I think it it's yeah, really good point to have to have the porta potties or or some facilities there. Uh and, and the math checks out. Um but where where the costs can grow, and I think we, we need to hear from DPW on this, is maintenance of it. Um and not not that they maintain porta potties, but what happens if youth get there at night and decide to tip one over? or something like that and now this becomes the town's problem and so i just wonder um and maybe dbw doesn't do the research but they would know about the the man time needed but if there's information available about what sort of burden this becomes for a community that has them um i i think we should have them i just think we need to kind of go in with eyes open as to the the secondary costs that that could be associated with it Okay. Did you want to make the motion, Rob? Sure. I'll move to request recommendations from the Park and Rec Commission, Public Works, and the School Department on potential options to address the need for adequate restroom facilities at athletic fields for consideration at the Council's July 25th, 2022 meeting. Second. Motion made and seconded. Further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And no abstentions. That motion carries. Great. Uh, next item on our agenda are resolutions. And the first one is from our library. And we have our library director, Kristen Chin, here. Um, Kristen, can you tell us about this one? If you could come up to the microphone, please. Um, so the public libraries across the state are bringing this resolution to their boards and then consequently to their town councils. Um, since 2009, um, the grant and aid, which is based on 
the amount, the allocation from the cities and towns to support library services has, there is a general law stating that that should be 25% of the town's allocation to the library. Um, and since 20, 2009, it has not reached 25%. Um, the statute has, you know, a provision where the General Assembly doesn't have to follow that rule, they can underfund, but that is technically the law. So this and every year, we try to get this reinstated. Um, it does make a difference. And as you can see here, the town will gain um, almost $38,000. Um, so I went to my trustees and they supported this resolution and asked me to bring it to the town council um, to see if you will pass this. Okay. Any questions? Does anyone want to make this motion? I'll make a motion to approve the resolution in support of restoring the state budget, the allocation for funding public libraries to the 25% level as required by Rhode Island General Laws 29-6-2. Second. Motion made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries with no abstentions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next resolution is for Pride Month. We're in Pride Month now, and um, this is a resolution presented by Council Breyer. Council Breyer. Yes, so um, two years ago in 2019, the council uh, unanimously passed the first um, Pride Month resolution establishing Barrington Pride Month. Uh, just a couple of days ago, we were able to hold the first in-person flag raising ceremony, which is great. Um, probably close to 150 or so people there. Um, students spoke, a uh, former BHS graduate spoke, and really um, moving for the community. A theme for it this year, and, and it's reflected in the resolution, is um, protecting trans youth. Uh, throughout the country uh, and, and even locally, um, legislation has been put in place in some states to um, prohibit transgender youth from participating in sports and to prohibit them from learning about themselves and uh, fellow students in schools. And so um, that's that's reflected in this resolution that um, that such legislation should not uh, come to be, should not pass. It was introduced in Rhode Island and was um, pretty resoundingly defeated, which was good to see. Um, of, of note, with regard to our resolutions and legislation, um, the past two years, each year there has been two um, state bills that have been discussed in our resolutions and we requested passage of them in both years both bills passed um, this year there wasn't a specific piece of legislation um, seeking passage but there were um, some that that people were happy to see defeated so that's why there there isn't um, any specific reference to current legislation to pass this year but still important to recognize the community and, and put this forward Okay. Um, any questions? Um, yeah, it's hard enough to be a kid uh, without being persecuted. Okay. Um, do you want to make a motion? Uh, make a motion to approve the resolution celebrating the month of June as Barrington Pride Month as presented. Second. Motion made and seconded for the discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No abstention, that motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Um, next item on our agenda is uh, to discuss an act on bids. And the first one is Chief Bissett. Um, uh, first is uniforms. Chief? Uh, yes, it, this is a uh, really a routine uh, a bid. It's uh, We're required uh, every two years to supply the uh, fire department uh, with station uniforms um, by their collective bargaining agreement. So we went out for bids on the trousers, the most expensive part of the uniforms. And I received one back, bid back from Mike and Wayne's Incorporated from Fairhaven, Massachusetts uh, to supply those uh, trousers at a cost of $13,770. Okay. Um, any questions for Chief? 
Does anyone want to make a motion to approve the bid from Mike and Wayne's Inc., 163 Huddleston Avenue, Fairhaven, Mass., 02719, for the purchase of firefighter clothing in the amount of $13,770, including delivery? So moved. Second. Made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. And the next one is training equipment, Chief? Yes, the second uh, bid here is uh, to purchase um, mannequins. They are training mannequins. Uh, they will allow us to do um, EKG training um, and staying in concert with our state protocols. Uh, we can use these mannequins for intubation training, IV therapy, and the like. Um, we There is a need to stay up uh, you know, in our training standards and these mannequins are now so sophisticated that we can, we can change EKG interpretations. Um, so we can put someone through uh, a rigorous training uh, to make sure they understand and see exactly what's happening uh, when EKGs change uh, as we perform uh, the state protocols. Um, monies for this actually uh, doing the 24 pods that we had for, for the uh, vaccinations, the state was providing some funding back to the fire department for that. And after expenses, we were still able to have uh, this amount of money left in that meds account. Um, so I'm proposing that uh, we purchase um, these mannequins from the Laredo Medical Equipment Company of uh, Wappingers Falls, New York, at a cost of $19,000. Thirteen dollars and forty-nine cents. Uh, Chief, is it is it still true that um, all of our um, I want to say firefighters, but all of our firefighters are cardiac care level EMTs? Yes, that is absolutely correct. That is uh, part of their contract with the, with the town that they uh, become uh, ENT certified, C certified, and they maintain that throughout their employment. Right. And uh, Chief, are you still uh, EMT certified? I still am after many years. My, uh, I'm always proud to say my EMT number in the state of Rhode Island is one. So <laughs> my, gray, my gray hair has some merit to it. <laughs> it's earned. Thank you, Chief. Uh, does anyone want to make a motion to award the bid from Lateral, Lateral Lairdall Medical Equipment Corporation, 167 Myers Corners Road, Wappingers Falls, New York, 12590, for the purchase of EMT training aids in the amount of $19,013.49, including delivery. So moved. Uh, motion's made. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Chief. Uh, the next is from the Planning Department and our planner, Teresa Crean. Yes, thank you, um, President Carroll. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right, very good. Um, so this is requesting approval of $41,871.10 to cover the purchase and installation of three electric vehicle charging stations for um, electric vehicle fleet expansion at the town of Barrington's public safety complex. And um, we currently have two what are called level two electric vehicle chargers down at police cove park the models that we are proposing for the um public safety complex would be similar to those found at police cove park they would not be the rapid chargers that we have at town hall um, but this proposal is to take advantage of an opportunity to get reduced pricing for installation half price on the infrastructure for stations themselves and purchase a five-year warranty and then the cloud computer service that goes into monitoring these stations, specifically for the public safety vehicles um, with the Bar Barrington Police Department. So these would not be open to the public. These would be off the, you know, the, um, the, the public search, um, you know, computer map that they have through the company called ChargePoint. Uh, these would be specifically used for um, the public safety vehicles, the police vehicles that are um, where we're proposing to have a fleet expansion of our police vehicles over the years after the end of life of our current uh, vehicle fleet. So taking advantage of the um, 
uh, National Grid um, rebate program. It provides $19,000 per station for installation and then 50% of the station costs. So when we look at the $110,000 price tag of this and then the um, reduction in the installation costs and the station costs that would leave would give us a rebate of over $68,000 and then leaving the town with a cost of 41,871.10 um, that we are proposing could be supported by funds from the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question though. Uh, if, if ultimately and, and hopefully, uh, I keep looking at the Ford website when, where they talk about the electric Explorer because that's our, our police department does love the Explorer. It seems to fit everything. If we were to be able to get in the future a fleet of electric police cars, um, these chargers are not the... I don't know what you call them, superchargers or rapid chargers. Rapid, yep. Right. Would they be sufficient, these kinds of chargers be sufficient to keep the, the police vehicles on the road? It's my understanding that the level two charging stations take about four hours to um, do, give a full charge. And the rapid stations that we have at Town Hall are 25, 30 minutes. Um, so we still have those available for the police vehicles if we if we have that need, but then um, the chart these charging stations would offer like an overnight charge or an off um, a, a shift change kind of charge. Um, and I'm I'm wondering about and maybe Chief Coria could answer this. Are, are do we have uh, police vehicles that just um, are they? constantly in use or do we have vehicles that sit for a shift and then um, somebody else comes in and takes them? Um, we, the vehicles that we put out on the road for the patrol, um, we, we generally have four. Um, we have enough to rotate those based on, on the current staffing levels. Where we might run into some trouble is the one, the cars, the excess cars that we use for traffic details that you'll see up on Wampanoag Trail um, yeah. with paving jobs and, and around the town for with different contractors. That would be the only, um, only problem I would see moving forward if we were just addressing that issue. But what I do see is it's, it's a slow changeover if you will, it wouldn't be something that we'd complete in, in two to three years, the total changeover to electric or hybrid wherever we went. Right, I, uh, I'm, I'm guessing, so usually those cars that are used for details are ones that had been patrol cars and, and then rotate sort of to that, that next level. And I'm sure that by the time we're ready to have a fleet of patrol cars that are all electric will will need more infrastructure for it than than even this, um, but that's down the road a piece. Uh, any yeah, questions? I think, on this? I think that's accurate, Councilor Breyer. I had a, a question on the location in the parking lot, and reason being, I know that the Barrington Farm School uses a, a trail that kind of connects the farm to the back of the lot um, and they sometimes bring a, a truck in so that they can load the, the compost out. Um, I just wonder if that's still gonna be accessible. I don't know that it's a reason to decide for or against, but. Yeah, the, the nope. locate, go ahead, Chief. No, God, Teresa, sorry. Yeah, that's no, okay. The proposed location of these stations would actually be, um, Oh, very close to the building. It's where the existing police cars, the current police cars are, police vehicles are lined up and parked um, by their um, storage shed. And I, sorry if I'm botching the name of those facilities chief, um, but it's also adjacent to the existing fuel tank. Mm -hmm. So the six, the six spaces that we're proposing these three stations are not really on the, the circulation route of the public or the, um, the abutters. Thank you. Right. Any other questions? Yes, Vice President Hum. I, I actually have a question, not, not 
specific to this project, but I'm just curious in terms of the running total. What what um at, if if this were approved and assuming it is, um, what's our balance of the American Rescue Plan Act, just so that we know going forward? I don't have those numbers. Um, okay. Two point. Sorry, it's about two point nine ish to three million. Okay. I, I, it's around yeah high, that's high two nine that's a, that's nine. As, uh, as specific as i need i'm just yeah, just curious right. yeah okay yes tom no, rather shy this no not at all listen being in emergency public service and stuff i don't think that's a logical idea to have a four-hour charging station especially if they need another car in an emergency for 20 minutes, I don't know what the difference would be in spending a little bit more money to get the 20-minute charger. You know, it's not like you can put a police car there, but maybe you can. But with only six police cars active, I think, well, when I worked for the town as a dispatcher, they had six zones. So I don't know how that is. That was a car in each zone. So if... They switch cars every eight hours. While they're in roll call, the car could be charging and not taking four hours. So that means eight o'clock they would be able to use the car. So what happens in an emergency where they have to come in for, uh, you know, a storm or a bad fatal accident where it's taking up other officers on the scene? They're not going to be able to keep those cars charged if you're talking about three vehicles right now. So how much more would it be to add the 20 minute charger to the amount of money? And I also hear a lot of this opera money. How come we don't use any of the opera money to use in public buildings to restore ventilation and kill germs and all that other good stuff that we could be doing with it instead of projects? We use FEMA money for that. That's FEMA money, but uh, to... <clears throat> Before before you answer, and I don't know if you know the answer between the difference, but um, you don't generally, um, I have a plug-in hybrid that gets me 45 miles electric, and then it converts to gas. You generally don't let it run down to zero. Uh, I mean, even in my case, I usually have about five miles and then I plug it in um, on a level, on a very slow charger. So if they have essentially half a tank, they've still got 150 miles to go and then they can plug it in and it's not gonna take four hours to bring it up to the 300 miles or whatever the, I don't know what the Mach E does, but. I don't know, it just doesn't sound logical to have something that takes four hours for an emergency vehicle to charge when you can do it in 20. What's, well, what's the difference in price? It's significant, it's the two, the two chargings stations at Town Hall, there, there's only one port per station, and that was over $200,000. Most of that was covered by National Grid. <clears throat> and also, there's no <clears throat> there's no funding for that right now uh, for these fast chargers. I think the state's going to be focusing on uh, interstate uh, infrastructure, and because uh, you got to provide this so people can get from point A to point B uh, and uh, you know, be able to get quick access. Uh, we were able to take advantage of that, and those those chargers, those fast chargers, are available in a pinch to, to get that bump up you know, pretty quickly, um, no matter what. And so that that's what makes this kind of feasible is that we have that existing those two existing fast chargers that we can plug into right now. So that's how, how we're able to get the EV, the, the current electric vehicle, without having the charging stations behind town hall, I'm behind the public safety building right now. Right. Right. Councilor Brown. The sales pitch might be about 20 minutes, but I have a fully electric car and I use the, the town hall charging station and it's closer to an hour. It does slow down at 80%. It's just, it's designed to slow it down. It's hard to get to 100% because it slows. It's designed to slow down mm -hmm. after 80% charge. Mm -hmm. so. so what would happen if we get two instead of three? Well, we have two, but no, at the police station. It would be a couple hundred thousand dollars. It's it's on it's it's actually kind of odd, but we, it's actually less money to the town to do three than to do two. I can't explain that, but <laughs> so clean energy is not cheap. 
Um, yeah, and the concern, the concern is also we talked about a cheap Korea, Korea but that uh, there's going to be a high demand for these installations, and we're going to be competing as soon as this inventory comes online. They're going to rush to get this infrastructure in. We already have it, and now we can get the inventory. So um, yeah. that's why we thought with the fast chargers, and I think we might be the only town anywhere around here. It has a fast charger, so we have that advantage at town hall. Plus the plus these chargers, which supplement, which supplement that. That that really helps us get more more cars on the road. Right. <clears throat> okay. Um, uh, I'll make a motion to authorize forty one thousand eight hundred seventy one dollars ten cents from the American Rescue Plan Act funds for the town's portion of the cost in, of installing three electric vehicle charging stations at the Public Safety Building in accordance with pricing in State MPA 509, subject to approval of the town's application for funding from National Grid. Second. M made and seconded further discussion. Yes. Sorry Mr. to miss no. this, only, only to, to revise National Grid to Rhode Island Energy. Oh, yes. So we have an accurate. <laughs> this is Rhode Island. <laughs> We're going to call it National Grid for the next 20 years. Where National uh, Grid used to be. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Alex is still around. <laughs> <but don't be laughs> that's right. Um, so to revise it to Rhode Island Energy. Uh, made and was seconded. seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. Okay, so now we're uh, discuss an act on ordinances. We have none to introduce and we're, we have three public hearings. I'm opening the public hearing into ordinance 2022-5, an ordinance amendment to chapter 134, parks and recreation, section 134-3, rubbish to include a fine for littering by the public at a town park or town beach. Um, and I think we've talked about this in the past. So unless anybody, yeah, please, Vice President. Yeah. And thank you. The only thing I wanted to mention, which we talked about in the past, um, and I would propose to do tonight, so to the extent there's any public comment, um, have this for consideration, is the Parks and Rec Commission. Um, I think there's um, the, the town manager comment, I think, might need to be revised. But in any event, um, they proposed first offense, $50, second offense, $100 third and subsequent offenses during a one year period, uh, $200. Um, I just, I double checked um, my email from Mike Seward and uh, that would be consistent with what Parks and Rec recommended. Um, I'd support that as well for the reasons discussed at the last meeting, um, meaning that um, a warning can happen at any time. And frankly, I think warnings will probably happen um, fairly often. Um, so if, if, if whatever the offense is rises to the, the nature of meeting, uh, some kind of sanction, you might as well put some kind of monetary sanction on it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, would anyone from the public like to be heard on this? Yes, please. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so I'm Sean Vingalani at 85 Upland Way. Um, I would like to challenge, the, I appreciate the town taking action on this and I would challenge you to do more. Uh, there are a lot of times where I'm out, believe it or not, with one and a half legs walking around and there's a ton of trash and a ton of littering. And I know that I think you have children who play sports in this town. You do as well. I, I would imagine I, you, nobody else mentioned it, but I think you do. It's an atrocity after every weekend after the sports leagues play on these town fields to walk around. And I've got pictures on my cell phone. If anyone wants to see just last weekend, I took over 30 pictures on my phone of trash at just Shinazi field. And this may sound really harsh, but what I mean by doing more is if the folks who are at the sports leagues aren't able to collectively clean up the trash on the fields when their kids are done playing, the DPW shouldn't mow the field the next time. They should let it grow. There need to be consequences to people's actions to litter. You can't expect that a police officer is going to be everywhere that they need to be or that we would like them to be to issue a summons or issue a ticket when they see someone littering. It's just not possible. So that's the first thing I would say. 
I would challenge you to do more. And then specifically, there's another area in town that is an atrocity for littering and it's behind the Y. Specifically the dirt road that's closed by the way, half the year. Um, and I go back there all the time. I've got two dogs that keep me very busy. So I walk back there a lot. And when it's closed during the year, there's no trash, nothing. Cause nobody can drive back there except for utility vehicles or the public works or the folks, I think is there, there's some type of towel back there on the, on the backside of the softball field. And there are, there are usually, I see a pickup truck back there or something like that, but it's closed. Nobody complains about it during that time of year being closed. And then it opens up in the spring and there are cars going every which way down that dirt road and there's trash. This year, there was a wooden pallet left right on the water's edge with someone had the audacity to leave a box from their house with their name on it. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, I appreciate the, the chief's officer for talking me down from offering to take it back to their house <laughs> because they were right in saying that they who knows if it was somebody else who put it there and not the actual owner of the box. But I digress. Last year, someone dumped mattresses and box springs. And there was another person I see back there who had a pickup truck and voluntarily went and took them to uh, not the town recycling center, but I think the, the larger one in Johnston. Um, this year, people who dumped boxes, big boxes, like stuff you get at like Home Depot. I went and took that stuff to the depart the um, recycling center here in town. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, someone dumped a whole basketball net, the backboard, the hoop, the net, the pole, the cement that was in the ground, holding it up back there. So my my challenge to you is close it permanently. There's no reason that that needs to be open. Everybody who goes back there can walk back there. I'm proof of that. There's ample parking, extremely close to get back there right by the Y in the two parking lots right by the Y. Fishermen walk back there all the time, no problem. There's a place on uh, Legion Way that gets gives you um, boat ramp access right onto the same pond. Nobody ever has a problem getting there. And also I would say it's open at a time of year when kids are riding their bikes to school or walking to school and people are flying that, that up and forth and back and forth down that dirt road. There's zero reason that anyone should be driving back there except the DPW or some utility vehicle servicing whatever that antenna is back there. So I, just, I appreciate everything the town does. I appreciate how the police handle it. I appreciate how the Department of Public Works handles it. But we, we the, we, the people in this town, need to step up and handle it. We need to not do this. And if we can't respect this, these resources that we have, we shouldn't have unfettered access to them. That's it. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone else from the public want to be heard? Phil, is there anyone online? Hang on a second. I see two hands raised. Okay. Anthony Rico. I saw Tony earlier here. Um, please go ahead. Tony? Okay. I moved up Mike Seward to take control. Okay. Mike Seward, who is chair of our Parks and Rec. Hi, folks. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead, Mike. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'd like to re reiterate what Mr. Hum said um, about the Park and Recreation vote. And uh, it was, he was highly accurate about that. What precipitated our desire for this ordinance is to be able to sign um, the middle school basketball courts with something that has a little teeth in it. So I would just like to say, just think about a, a verbal warning as your first offense on a sign at a place like that. What good is that gonna do? So we're, 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 we're in favor of the, the ordinance. Um, we just like to see some teeth in it, that's all. Okay. Can you Thank hear me you. Now? Tony, please. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, I agree with Mr. Hum. I'm Mr. Tony, Tony, I think you have two uh, two devices going if you want to just mute one of them. Tony? Maybe switch them. 
All right. All right. How is that? Is that better? All right. Modern technology. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Mr. President, I agree with them, um, Mr. Hum. I, we want to have the fine there because it has to be the deterrent. That's number one. And the resident who gives spoken person will have to get the leagues involved and find out why there is trash. It's an easy field. I don't know what legal team it was, but we will have to look into that in a future meeting. So that was, that was sad to him, Mr. President, tonight, and members of the council. We will look into that in the park and Rex. I promise you that. So that's the first I heard of this. We will look into that trash problem. It's an easy field. Okay. Thank you. It's not the park and Rex fault. No. I mean, it's, no. the, it's the, the people who use the, the field that don't clean up that. Right. It's not like the park department isn't cleaning up that. They are. Yeah. That's the problem. They're just they're just going and cleaning up after us, and that's not that's not that's not that's not a deterrent to yeah. being able to continue to use these fields. Like if we can't keep keep if we can't keep them clean, we shouldn't be able to use them. Right. Right. As a community. Um. Well, we've heard from Mike. I think that's a sort of legacy hand up, yeah. unless he wants to speak oh, again. Okay, I'll take it down. Oops. Is there anyone else? That's that's it. Okay, uh, there being no one else, I'm closing the public hearing. Um, so it sounds like um, Vice President Hum would like to, and the Parks and Rec Department would like to amend this to say, first offense, a $50 fine. And the second and subsequent offenses during a one-year period, a one hundred dollar fine. No, and I, that, that that needs to be a correction. It's a second offense, one hundred dollar fine. Third and subsequent offenses during a one-year period, two hundred dollar fine. Okay. So fifty, one hundred, two hundred, two hundred, two hundred. Correct. Until the next year. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, I think the point that you made earlier was that the, the police would have some discretion to issue warnings. Um, you know, teenagers can sometimes be knuckleheads, but uh, having a, um, a kid who does something, maybe getting a warning would, would do a lot more, especially if they can't afford the hundred dollars. So, um, okay. Uh, do you want to make that motion to uh, as presented and amended? Uh, sure. I will move to adopt an ordinance amendment to chapter 144, public lands, use of section 144-17, littering prohibited, and chapter 134, parks and recreation, article one, general reg regulations, section 134-3, rubbish as presented and amended. Is there a second? Second. Made and seconded further discussion. All those in favor? Okay, I, oh. I just wanted to add, I, I support this, but also what Mr. Gangliani said. I think we do need to look at maybe some other steps we can take for litter around town in general, both small things along trails, but also certainly mattresses, pallets, things like that, if, if there's more we can do. I don't know what the start of that process is like, but I, I think it's something we should look to. We do a lot to protect the environment, but we also need to do something to protect our yards. Okay. I, I agree with that. Absolutely. Okay. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And no abstentions, that motion carries. Thank you. Um, next item is uh, an amendment to the personnel policies. I am opening the public hearing into uh, an amendment 2022-11 ordinance amendment to chapter 33 personnel policies, article five attendance and leave. And if uh, before we take public comment, I would just ask our uh, director of human resources, uh, Marianne Alvera to take us through this change. Sure, Please. Thank you. sure, thank you. Um, first of all, uh, let me explain our current policy. The, the way the ordinance reads today is if a non-union employee, um, they are only allowed to take accrued sick time for their own personal illness. And um, the unions uh, have 
all built in some allotment of time where they can use some of their sick time to care for an immediate family member. And, um, you know, that ranges from five days, seven days, four days, three days, the, the different unions all have different amounts. And so if, for example, one of our employees had a sick child, they'd be forced to use a vacation day to care for that child. So after taking a look at what the unions did with their um, family time, we are looking to incorporate five days um, where an employee could use up to five days to care for a child, a stepchild, a grandchild, a parent, or a spouse. Okay. Uh, thank you. Any, um, Councilor Brown? Clarifying question. Sure. Just to confirm, this doesn't change uh, the accrual or the no. cap. No. It's just how you can use the days you would have. Otherwise. That's correct. There's there's no change to what employees are accruing currently. There's no additional benefits given. It's just allowing them access to use them for a family member. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, opening this to public comment. Does anyone? Is there anyone online? Okay. There being none, I'm closing the public hearing. Uh, any further comments from the council or does anyone want to make a motion? Make a motion to adopt an ordinance amendment to chapter 33 personnel policies, article five attendance and leave as presented. Second. Okay. Motion made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And no abstention, that motion carries. And then the, thank you, Mary. Thank you, thank you. Um, the, the third, um, uh, ordinance is our renewal of our declaration of emergency. I'm opening the public hearing into amendment ordinance 2022-12 renewal of declaration of emergency. Uh, is there anyone who would like to be heard on that? No one here present, any hands raised? No. Nope. Okay, does anyone want to make a motion or have any comments? to adopt the 2022-12 renewal of declaration of emergency as presented. Second. Aye. Made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And no abstentions. That motion carries. Uh, so the next item on our agenda is to set the agenda for the July 25 meeting. We don't have a meeting in August, but one of the things that's on the July 25 meeting is the flag policy. And as um, Councilor Castell wisely suggested, um, it makes sense for us to have one meeting a year and maybe a separate meeting because often there's a lot of time involved. So um, I wonder if we can um, ask our, our town clerk to poll to see when folks might be available in late June or um, sometime in July before that meeting to hold a flag policy um, and, and flags um, discussion, both as to whether uh, we want to continue the way we've been doing it, and if so, what flags we want to do. Uh, does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then we also would be talking about fee forgiveness for police details um, for community events. This is a, um, probably a kind of a tricky one because how do you decide? Um, I mean, I know that um, uh, one of my friends is having a, a uh, class reunion, I think at Latham Park. It's gonna be great, but it's not so much a community event, it's more of a class event. Um, although I'm sure we could crash it if we wanted to. Um, so that's on there. And then the green memo format for bid memos to obtain a more environmentally friendly option. Uh, this Councilor Breyer's idea. Is there, are there any others? Councilor Breyer. So I have um, two. One is um, I tend to introduce or, or file for introduction uh, ordinance amendment to the um, smoking vaping policy, prohibiting it from um, town, uh, from town property and to include cannabis um, smoking and vaping. 
And the other was, I brought up a couple months ago and wanted to resurface it, hopefully for discussion at next meeting, putting some sort of committee or commission together to evaluate the FTM so that when the Charter Review Commission is put together, they can be ready with a recommendation from that group so the FTM doesn't consume all the time of the Charter Commission. Okay. Um, that's, that is something that seems to be a perennial uh, topic. Um, so we can, we can certainly discuss that at the next meeting. Um, um, Vice President Hum. Um, just the, the item we talked about today, the restrooms at town athletic facilities. Okay. Anything else? Okay, and, and if anybody thinks of anything, just let me know and um, we'll get it on the agenda. Uh, anything further? If not, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank you, everyone. Thanks especially to the staff for staying and this has been great with the microphones a lot better. Thanks. Yeah. We're adjourned.